सर मैं लाइव इसके अंदर लाइव हूँ डर सा लगता है कभी कभी एक मिनट वेट कर दीजिए पंडिया साहब उसके बाद चालू कर दीजिए आप अनम्यूट कर दीजिए पहले एक मिनट वेट करिए ओके पॉसिबल की ग्रीन सिग्नल सर आई विश हंड्रेड टू नॉट आउट Arun Batav, sir, should I start now? I think three minutes to go. Ah, you start. Okay. 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 Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello, friends. Namaste and good morning to everybody. Uh, welcome to the webinar series on the century of quantum mechanics and steel going strong. Friend, today is the third and final day of our webinar series. and today we are very fortunate that padma shri professor hc verma sir is being with us online and he is going to introduce our eminent speaker dr anand kumar ja it gives me a great pleasure and honor to introduce a professor hc verma sir friends padma shri professor hc verma sir is a retired professor from iit kanpur Uh, professor verma is an experimental physicist his research interests had been in a nano fabrication using focused ion beam magnetism in graphite on irradiation by ion beam uh, friends he is a nuclear physicist he has published 139 research papers in a reputed journals of physics he has authored a graduate undergraduate and school textbook his most popular work in concept of physics a two volume book on uh, on quantum physics also uh, professor verma had been associated with the social causes from his childhood he has been instrumental in making a group of iit kanpur faculty members and students together with the local youth to run an ngo called siksha sopan through various centers in the villages around iit kanpur siksha sopan is in a direct daily contact with about 250 families and under the leadership of professor verma sir at these centers indian values and cultures are taught together with giving them an educational hub siksha sopan runs a various scholarship program which helps the poorest of poor to continue education friends professor verma has developed more than 600 physics experiments which can be used by teachers as a demo in their classroom he has also produced a set of 45 video lectures in hindi at school levels he conducts workshop of physics school teachers where he impresses upon using demo based physics teaching in which student can connect science with life through this extensive series of workshop professor verma sir has motivated large number of physics teachers of our country his latest focus have been conducting a free online courses for bsc student across small cities and towns in the hindi belt recently in the lockdown period you know to activate the physics educators he has conducted eight week online courses learning physics through simple experiments Every year in summer, Professor Verma sir conducts a six-day workshop of about 50 Uttar Pradesh physics teachers. Based on this camp workshop, interaction and 
uh, 26 teachers have opened their own laboratories and these laboratories are known as Anvishikas. In 2011, Professor Verma initiated a new project called National Anvishika Network of India, we call NANI, which has become a flagship program of Indian Association of Physics Teachers. Friends, Professor Verma is an executive committee member of Indian Association of Physics Teachers, which works for physics education in school and college. He has been awarded many prestigious awards and recently in the year of two, uh, 2020, the government of India honored him, the Padma Shri, the fourth highest civilian award in the Republic of India. Friends, uh, there is a long list of his achievements. Uh, here with us, we have Honorable Professor Vice Chancellor Sir, Professor Parimal Sir is present. I request Vice Chancellor Sir to welcome Professor H.C. Verma on behalf of MS University, sir. Over to Vice Chancellor, sir. <coughs> yeah. Namaskar, Suprabhat. Uh, 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 <coughs> let me at the outset uh, appreciate uh, the efforts that have been put in by our Honorable Dean, uh, Professor Arun Pratap, Faculty of Technology and Engineering. Uh, it is indeed, uh, you know, a matter of pleasure and privilege for the university, you know, to become a hub for so many stalwarts. And uh, uh, I was very keenly listening, uh, you know, uh, to the credentials, the contribution that uh, Padma Sri Prasar H.C. Verma sir has made. Uh, a, a small request which I would uh, like to make <laughs> on behalf of the university to Professor Arun Pratap. Uh, because I think I'm tempted to, you know, do that uh, after listening Dr. T.C. Pandya from the Gujarat yeah. Science Academy. Uh, Verma sir, uh, we, can, we in fact conduct a couple of workshops uh, in the university uh, where we in fact try to collect some problems, live problems from the industry and then we put in efforts, especially at the Faculty of Technology and Engineering to work on it. Uh, I'm really deeply moved, you know, by, uh, you know, getting details about, uh, you know, the efforts that you put in. I, I believe it, what I would narrate these as no honor, you know, maybe from government of India can match uh, the love and passion and affection with which you have uh, nurtured the um, profession of physics and uh, your love and affection for students. I think it has, it has, it has, it is really motivating and inspiration, inspirational to all of us. On behalf of the university, Professor Arun, uh, let us explore the opportunity of inviting sir. We can have, uh, you know, uh, sir scholars, uh, uh, maybe not only of MS and Baroda, but surrounding universities also. When we are, when we reach back to normal, I think it would be a great pleasure. And it, I would say that it would really act as, you know, a, a strong motivational booster for the research scholars. Uh, I'll just share one small experience, you know, and I will have to move out because there is another commitment which I, but uh, I really wanted to be with all of you, the galaxy of experts. Uh, the other day we had Professor Loknathan, Josip Puraji is with us, Professor Ajay Gatak. I think uh, I never met so many people, uh, you know, who have really made a very big impact on the physics education and uh, I, 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 I thought that I should not miss an opportunity to welcome you to express our deep sense of gratitude to the support that you have provided uh, you know to the Maharaja Sayajir of University of Baroda but I, I believe uh, that um, of, of course now the concept of virtual lab is very much there but I, I don't know uh, uh, Professor Verma you please guide us about what are the areas, you know, where probably you want the young, gen, current generation will have to focus upon. What I understand based on my own experience of three decades as a teacher, um, I, I believe the foundation that normally we find is very weak. And then with that weak foundation, you know, when we get students in the university set up and then they aspire to become world-class researchers, I, 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 I think... Uh, this is my personal opinion as a teacher of the uh, you know, university, is that um, we really need to 
put in lot of efforts right from the school level to create and nurture interest for certain subjects and if we can create a sound foundation i always believe uh, that we need senior most teachers to come and start teaching at the first year because i think this is the age <laughs> this interface only can inspire them to give their best to deliver their best i am i'm very happy sir that uh, you know you have decided to spend time with uh, uh, our university and you are going to address so uh, on behalf of the university sir we place on record sincere thanks to you and uh, on behalf of the university and on my personal behalf sir uh, i would extend a personal invitation to you whenever it is convenient to you i think uh, as per your convenience i would request uh, all the uh, you know the heads of the departments and particularly professor arun pratap and all my young team of department of physics and applied physics that let us create an opportunity for sir to come here and you know spend some time you know as per his convenience i know uh, he remains very busy but i think um, sir if you can come because uh, no technology on this earth can replace the one to one interface the human interface <clears throat> i think which is very very crucial there are positives and negatives but i believe that one to one interaction in person i think that is truly magical and inspirational so sir once again uh, we welcome you and uh, uh, thanks a lot for support to university and the activity of the gujarat science academy national science academy and the association of indian physics association of which i believe you are you are the you know pioneering contributor i think um, collectively we can really make it big and i always say before i close that if you really want to become rich please go to industry if you really want to contribute if you are not looking for money if you are not if you are not interested to become rich please come to academics i think it's a noble profession where we are here to contribute we are not here to gain we are here to give i think uh, i'm really touched with the philosophy uh, you know the way uh, dr pandya introduced you lot of takeaways for i believe the participants and uh, so thank you very much and uh, we look forward for a long term association and uh, your continued blessings on our university thank you thank you very much namaskar thank you thank you namaskar uh, professor pandya and professor vyas can i just say one sentence to professor verma yes sir yes sir uh, thank you thank you professor verma uh, very welcome again as professor vyas has already indicated i just wanted to add one you know fact in gujarat we are having a uh, very decreasing number of uh, science students uh, you know coming to various disciplines of uh, science uh, especially uh, and uh, if in your uh, you know address or your interaction if you just say a few lines what as academy and as universities we can do uh, you know to help the situation i will be very grateful for your comments thank you very much so thank you sir help sir uh, thank you very much honorable vice chancellor sir and professor pankaj joshi for your kind words and remarks now without taking a much time i request professor verma sir to introduce our eminent speaker and bless us over to verma sir thank you sir uh, thank you all thank you the university the organizing team and all the people involved in this uh, webinar main to bhul chuka angrezi sir koi baat nahi sir i it is a retirement ke baad to mauka milta nahi hai angrezi bolne ka koi baat nahi sir main hindi mein apni baatein karunga vice chancellor sahab ka bahut bahut dhanyawad unhone mere se bahut sari bahut drishti di hai mujhe aur joshi sir apne bahut pyari baat kahi hai ki jo situation hai उसके अंदर में क्या कर सकते हैं ताकि जो फाउंडेशन है वो मजबूत बने लोग जो है वो साइंस के प्रति भावनात्मक रूप से जुड़े इमोशनली उसके साथ में अटैच हो ये बहुत जरूरत है और इंडियन एसोसिएशन ऑफ फिजिक्स टीचर्स और बहुत सारे लोग मैं पर्सनली इस समस्या को बहुत गहराई के साथ अनुभव करता हूँ और इसीलिए ये सारी 
कवायद है स्टूडेंट्स के बीच की प्रोसेस देने की उनके कैंप्स करने की फेस टू फेस इंटरेक्शन की बात आपने कही बिल्कुल ठीक बात है कि जैसे कहा अभी वाइस चांसलर साहब ने कि उसका सब्सटीट्यूट तो है ही नहीं तो उस तरह के कैंप्स ऑर्गेनाइज करके और चीज़ें करके हम लोग इसको करने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं यूनिवर्सिटी सिस्टम सचमुच हमारे देश के लिए बहुत ही वीर की आती है तो अगर हमारा यूनिवर्सिटी सिस्टम मजबूत होगा तभी हम वास्तव में दूर दूर तक अपने काम कर सकेंगे क्योंकि हमारा जो मेन वर्कफोर्स आता है वो यूनिवर्सिटी सिस्टम से ही आता है और इसीलिए आजकल हमने बीएससी के स्टूडेंट्स के ऊपर बीएससी के सलेबस को कैसे ठीक प्रकार से उसके माध्यम से सलेबस को पढ़ाना तो उतना महत्वपूर्ण नहीं है वो तो कहीं से भी कोई पढ़ सकता लेकिन वो एक केवल माध्यम है उस माध्यम से इंटरेक्शन करके और सही कल्चर सोचने का सही कल्चर रास्ते निकालने का सॉल्यूशन ढूंढने का वो कैसे करना उसके साथ हम लोग जुटे हैं और यूनिवर्सिटी सिस्टम और जो भी आपके साइंस एकेडमीज वगैरह हैं उन सब का बहुत बड़ा रोल हो सकता है इसके अंदर में तो ये सब बातें फिर कभी करेंगे हम लोग अभी जो मुझे मुख्य रूप से आज का टास्क है कि आनंद तो पर अवेलेबल है वो तो आजकल बहुत आसान है कि हम लोग सब ढूंढ लेते हैं कि किसके बारे में क्या क्या है वो आई डी खड़गपुर से वो उन्होंने एम एस किया फिर रजिस्टर से उन्होंने पी एच किया और फिर हाँ ये सारी चीज़ें तो पता है ही एक्सपीरियंस वगैरह लीजिए हमारा काम हो आसान हो गया सारी चीज़ें लिखी हैं तो हम कुछ अपनी पर्सनल बातें हाजिर के बारे में बताना चाहेंगे सबसे पहला तो ये कि आनंद कुमार झा जी और मैं हम दोनों एक ही शहर के जन्म में है अरे वाह <laughs> और वो शहर है दरभंगा बिहार का दरभंगा तो वहीं के वो भी हैं वहीं का मैं भी हूँ तो ये पहला कनेक्शन उनके साथ में मेरा है और दूसरा एक प्यारी सी बात बताऊँ इनकी एक बहुत अच्छी सी लेबोरेटरी है जिसमें ये अपना क्वान्टम ऑप्टिक्स के एक्सपेरिमेंट करते हैं तो इनकी लेबोरेटरी के अंदर जब मैं गया तो जो केबिन्स बने हुए हैं उसमें जो अलग अलग इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स रखे गए हैं अलग अलग एक्सपेरिमेंट्स होते हैं उनके केबिन्स बने हुए हैं इनके जो रिसर्च स्कॉलर्स हैं उनके बैठने के केबिन्स बने हुए हैं इनका अपना जो केबिन है वो बना हुआ है उन सबके जो पार्टीशन कर कर के बनाया गया है वो सारी दीवारें वाइट बोर्ड्स की दीवारें दीवाने में छोटे छोटे जो उसके उसके पार्ट्स है दो फिट तीन फिट उसके पार्ट्स है जो कि एक फ्रेम के अंदर में लगे हुए हैं वो सबके सब वाइट बोर्ड्स है पूरी लेबोरेटरी जो वाइट बोर्ड से ही बनी हुई है जो भी कुछ है स्ट्रक्चर और हर किसी के ऊपर हर एक उसके ऊपर बढ़िया से फिजिक्स का कुछ ना कुछ लिखा हुआ है ये डिस्कस करते हैं स्टूडेंट्स डिस्कस करते हैं तो वो सब उसी के ऊपर वो लिखा होता है तो वो देखे मुझे मैं बहुत अच्छा लगा मुझे और फिर मैंने अपने घर में जब अलमारी अलमारियाँ बनाई तो कुछ अलमारियों में उसी तरह के प्लाईवुड लगाए जिसमें कि हम अपनी डिस्कशन वहाँ पे कर सके तो झाजी से ये चीज़ एक हमने हम सीखी क्वान्टम मैकेनिक्स के ऊपर ये वेबिनार है क्वान्टम मैकेनिक्स के साथ ही मेरा एक बड़ा गहरा सा रिश्ता है जब मैंने एम किया था आई आई कानपुर में तो कुल मिलाकर 20 कोर्सेज हुए थे टू ईयर एम में और उस 20 कोर्सेज में 19 कोर्सेज में शिक्षकों ने मुझे ए ग्रेड दिया था और एक कोर्स में बी ग्रेड दिया है और जिसमें बी ग्रेड दिया था वो कोर्स था क्वांटम मैकेनिक्स का <laughs> यहाँ से क्वांटम मैकेनिक्स के साथ यूनिक हो गया ना देखो एक ही कोर्स है जिसमें मुझे बी मिला था और वो कोर्स था क्वान्टम मैकेनिक्स का तो वो यूनिकनेस आ गई उसके अंदर में लेकिन हमारे जो शिक्षक थे डॉक्टर ए पी शुक्ला उन्होंने हमें क्वांटम मैकेनिक्स सिखाई एमएससी में इसके पहले बीएससी में पढ़ने यूनिवर्सिटी में भी हमने क्वांटम मैकेनिक्स पढ़ी बीएससी एस सी के अंदर में और उस समय में पॉवल क्रिजमैन की किताब होती थी और स्मिथ शिफ शिफ की किताब होती थी और वो दोनों ही मुझे बहुत नापसंद थी शिफ की किताब में तो कुछ पता नहीं चलता था ये क्या है और पॉवल क्रेजमैन की किताब में पता तो चलता था लेकिन क्वांटम मैकेनिक्स क्या है ये पता नहीं चलता था और बाकी चीजें पता चलती थी तो कुछ प्रोसीड्यूर्स जरूर सीख लिए थे पटना यूनिवर्सिटी में क्वांटम मैकेनिक्स के चीजों को सॉल्व करना सॉल्यूशंस लिखना सोल्यूशन बनाना आई कैन डिस्कशन निकालना वगैरह 
लेकिन क्वांटम मैकेनिक्स क्या होती है इसका परिचय वहाँ आया नहीं कि ए पी शुक्ला थे हमारे आईआईटी कानपुर के शिक्षक जो रिटायर हो चुके हैं जिन्होंने कि हमें वास्तव में क्वांटम मैकेनिक्स क्या है वो सिखाया और वो ऐसा सिखाया ऐसा सिखाया कि मेरा सबसे पसंदीदा शब्द जो है आज फिजिक्स के अंदर में तो क्वांटम मैकेनिक्स ही है तो बहुत मज़ा आता है क्वांटम मैकेनिक्स को पढ़ने में सुनने में पढ़ाने में ये करने में और उसके ऊपर ये पूरा वेबिनार अपना और करेंट्स क्या है ये बहुत ही मेरे लिए बहुत प्यारी बात है बहुत खुशी की बात है लेकिन एक सीमा तक तो क्वांटम मैकेनिक्स मैंने पढ़ी और मैंने समझी और उसको इंजॉय किया और आज भी करता हूँ बार बार जितनी बार कोर्स देना हो या और कुछ करना हो कोई स्टूडेंट कोई प्रश्न पूछ ले उतनी बार उसको बार बार जीता हूँ उस आनंद के पलों को जो क्वांटम मैकेनिक्स की अनुभूति है वो बार बार हमें आह्लादित करती है मन के अंदर में लेकिन ये जो मॉडर्न आजकल उसमें भी एक जो अभी की शताब्दी में इस शताब्दी के अंदर जो कुछ हो रहा है और क्वांटम एंगलमेंट और क्वांटम ऑप्टिक्स उसमें से एक है वो चीजें अभी मेरे को कुछ भी पता है नहीं और बच्चे बहुत बहुत पूछते हैं उसके बारे में एक्साइटमेंट बहुत है उसके बारे में तो जब मैंने इंडियन एसोसिएशन ऑफ फिजिक्स टीचर्स में इनका एक एन जी ई पी नेशनल ग्रेजुएट एग्जामिनेशन इन फिजिक्स होता है तो उसमें से कुछ जो सेलेक्टेड फर्स्ट ईयर के जो बी एस सी फर्स्ट ईयर के स्टूडेंट्स हैं उनमें से टॉप कुछ पैंतीस चालीस बच्चों का हम लोगों ने आई आई टी कानपुर में कैंप किया रेजिडेंशियल लगभग दो सप्ताह का और उसके अंदर में हमने डॉक्टर आनंद कुमार झा जी को इस क्वान्टम इंटेंगलमेंट को इंट्रोड्यूस करने का दायित्व दिया जो पहला एकेडमिक इंटरेक्शन मेरा इनके साथ में वहाँ पे आया तो वो पूरा इनके जितने लेक्चर्स हुए वो सारे मैंने अटेंड किए बिल्कुल बैठ करके क्योंकि मुझे भी सीखना था कि ये वो होता क्या है जिसकी इतनी चर्चा है जिसका इतना जलवा है जिसका आज की दुनिया के अंदर में वो होता क्या है और उस समय में वो इंटेंगलमेंट मुझे कितना समझ आया वो पता नहीं लेकिन इनका जो टीचिंग का स्टाइल है और स्टूडेंट्स के साथ इंटरेक्ट करने का जो स्टाइल है उसने मुझे इनका कायल बना दिया और उसके पहले चूंकि क्वांटम के लेक्चर हो चुके थे उस कैंप के अंदर में तो इनका काम थोड़ा आसान था लेकिन वो किस तरह से बेसिक्स से लेकर के चलना स्टूडेंट्स के साथ में कैसे जुड़ना और जोड़ना उनको तो वो बहुत ही अद्भुत रहा था वो और उसके बाद से फिर दोबारा जब भी इस तरह का कैंप हो या इस तरह की चीज हो तो मैं इनको जरूर कहता हूँ कि आपके लेक्चर्स तो होने ही चाहिए तो अभी इस मार्च महीने में भी हमने बीएससी के स्टूडेंट्स का एक कैंप किया था अपने शिक्षा विज्ञान के सेंटर पे वो भी एक ऑनलाइन कोर्स किया था हमने क्वांटम मैकेनिक्स के ऊपर बेसिक्स ऑफ क्वांटम मैकेनिक्स तो उसमें जितने करीबन छब्बीस हज़ार सत्ताईस हज़ार स्टूडेंट इनरॉल हुए थे उस कोर्स के अंदर में तो उनमें से चुन करके और कुछ पच्चीस छब्बीस स्टूडेंट्स को हमने यहाँ पर एक रेजिडेंशियल कैंप दस दिन कर दिया ताकि वो इंटरेक्ट कर सके हम लोगों के साथ में आई आई कानपुर के जो लोग हैं उनके साथ में एक साथ रह सके एक साथ रह कर के और जो जिंदगी से सीखना होता है जो वो भी बहुत महत्वपूर्ण होता है तो नाश्ता करते समय में चाय पीते समय में मैं रात को डिनर के बाद डिनर के पहले वो सब जो चर्चाएँ होती हैं इंटरेक्शन होते हैं एक दूसरे की जिंदगी को देखते हैं वहाँ से बहुत मोटिवेशन और बहुत इंस्परेशन मिलता है तो उसमें भी पूरे आनंद जी को हम लोगों ने इनवाइट किया और उस समय मैं तो अटेंड नहीं कर सका था बिकॉज ऑफ मेरा खुद का ही मेडिकल प्रॉब्लम हो गया था उस समय में बल्कि हम तो मुलाकात तक नहीं कर पाए थे अपने इन्वाइट स्पीकर के साथ में लेकिन जो हमें सूचनाएँ मिली वो ऐसी थी कि इनके लेक्चर्स हमने दिन भर के आखिरी में डिनर जब ब्रेक करते हैं हम शाम को करीबन जो भी टाइम टेबल था साढ़े पाँच छः बजे उस समय अंतिम लेक्चर झा साहब का होता था डेढ़ घंटे का इनको स्लॉट दिया जाता था उसके बाद एक दो घंटे का ब्रेक होता था और उसके बाद डिनर होता था फिर डिनर के बाद हम लोग दोबारा बैठते थे हम लोग मतलब जो कैंप के पार्टिसिपेंट्स थे और प्लस जो रिसोर्स पर्सन थे जो लोकल जो जितने जो रात को वहीं रहते थे तो वो सब फिर अपने बैठते थे वो चलता था और मुझे पता ये चला कि ये डेढ़ घंटे का के जो समय सीमा है इनको आनंद कुमार झा जी को बिल्कुल किसी दिन भी मानने नहीं दिया गया और वो डेढ़ घंटे की जगह ढाई घंटे और तीन घंटे तक इनकी क्लासेस 
क्योंकि उसके बाद वो ब्रेक था किसी दूसरे का क्लास होता था तो मजबूरी होती लेकिन उसके बाद तो वो डिनर का ब्रेक था दो घंटा उस दो घंटे के पूरे ब्रेक के अंदर में इनको लोग छोड़ते ही नहीं थे और क्लासरूम से ही बाहर नहीं निकलने देते थे इनका डेढ़ घंटे का क्लास दो घंटे ढाई घंटे तीन घंटे तक चलता था तो ऐसा प्रतिदिन हुआ इस प्रकार का ये हमें सूचना हुई कि बहुत ही बहुत ही तेजस्वी बहुत ही होनहार भविष्य के अंदर में बहुत हम आशाएं करते हैं डॉक्टर झा से बहुत सारे कंट्रीब्यूशन साइंस को मिलेंगे बहुत सारे कंट्रीब्यूशन भारत को मिलेंगे तो इस इंट्रोडक्शन के साथ ओवर टू पांड्या थैंक यू वेरी मच सर फॉर ए काइंड इंट्रोडक्शन सर थैंक यू एंड नाउ वी रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर आनंद कुमार झा फॉर हिज टॉक ऑन क्वांटम एंटेंगलमेंट ओवर टू डॉक्टर आनंद कुमार झा सर thank you uh, professor arun pratap ji uh, for for inviting me uh, for for this excellent lecture lag lag raha hai without video lagle acha aap unse lagle aaj chalu jale aaj chalu jale de lagle Uh, right so i think uh, at first i need to thank professor arun pradap for uh, kind of organizing this excellent webinar and again uh, uh, inviting me uh, to 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 kind of give this talk and i think the entire uh, in, in entire organizing team uh, as well uh, again uh, thank you so much for, to professor hc verma <laughs> for the that introduction i don't think uh, I, i really kind of uh, can live up to that but but uh, you know really thank you uh yeah so, since he was can mentioning about our connections so i have few, i think there are few more connections than just the darbanga uh so i uh, after his book came out we were kind of the first generation to kind of follow his concept of physics uh, to study for je so that was my first uh, real connection uh, uh, well all the indirect but that was uh, through through uh, his book and then again we were colleagues for a few years and then now he is a uh, uh, like neighbors uh, he is just a uh, uh, like kilom 2 kilometers from uh, campus and then uh, i mean everybody knows he is doing fantastic uh, uh, stuff and i had the opportunity in march to actually visit the shiksha sopan ashram and it's a, like just an amazing place and you just go there probably just the place itself kind of forces you to get interested in physics uh, and and kind of life uh, in general he has a little feel as well uh, where he does uh, uh some farming as well so the entire atmosphere is very very uh, uplifting uh and especially for physics you said i think people will become inquisitive just by visiting that place uh and uh, so i had a really good time those students were just fantastic very really good time giving that uh, you know those lectures in fact he was mentioning i spent 3 uh, hours to two and a half hours I, 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 in instead of one and half but in fact i just could finish only 50% of what i had planned because the students were just so nice and they were just kept asking questions and that is i think the main point finishing the you know lecture is never the main point so so yeah so so uh, with that again thanking everyone uh, i can uh, uh, i can start so should i share my screen or how should i do it is it visible yes sir okay okay so uh, uh, today i'm talking about quantum entanglement i think there have been fantastic talks on uh, different aspects of quantum mechanics in the last two days uh, and today uh, i will try to focus mostly on the very uh, basics of quantum entanglement i think i will just try to convey what exactly uh, quantum entanglement is at least some intuition about it and 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 just hint at what are the applications uh, that that people think that one can do with this uh, uh, quantum entanglement uh, so i'll just try to kind of uh, uh, have a sketch of that so uh, and in the entire process i will try to keep the math uh, uh, to a minimal level so so with that uh, let me get started so so first of all what is quantum entanglement so this is a although it's incorrect but it's a cartoon picture of you know what is the popular way of thinking about entanglement 
so entanglement is like if the two particles are entangled then if one is disturbed both gets uh, affected so so that is the kind of popular notion of entanglement although it is not entirely correct but that kind of conveys the idea that these two parties these two uh, parties are not independent if one is disturbed the other one uh, gets disturbed as well but but this feature uh, was not that liked by einstein and his uh, uh, you know uh, the other researchers at that point and uh, they really objected to kind of this kind of phenomenon uh, happening in quantum mechanics so so they then published a paper in 1935 that's although it's not called epr paradox but that's how it is kind of that paper is uh, quite often referred to so what that epr paradox is uh, i will just try to sketch it uh, uh, here so first of all the the first very basic principle of quantum mechanics is the uncertainty principle uh, and there was a, a very detailed lecture yesterday so i i, I don't think i will go uh, into much details of that so just a very very uh, quick uh, uh, summary of what's an uncertainty principle so i can do this through an example so if 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 there is a particle in the form of a plane wave then we say that its momentum is certain because it is going in a certain direction so its momentum is certain but its position is completely uncertain it can be anything uh, if we take another example for example this plane wave itself it goes through uh, like a slit and then it kind of diffracts so the the wave wave function or the state of this particle after the slit uh, for, for 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 that the position is certain because one knows that it is coming from this point but the momentum is completely uncertain because it is going in any direction so so if one then uh, uh, uses the first principle of quantum mechanics then what one sees that the to the extent that one can find the position and to the extent that one can find the position that product can never be uh, less than h bar by 2 it has to be greater than h bar by 2 and this is referred to as the uncertain relation so this is the very basic principle of quantum mechanics so in the in their paper in 1935 uh, einstein podolsky and rosen they first mentioned this that this is the first principle of quantum mechanics and then they come up with an example they consider a two photon system or other a two particle system which had had some interaction in the past and after that they had uh, gotten separated and maybe even uh, space like separated and then they considered uh, like a wave function for this particle i'm just writing this uh, uh, kind of math straight from their paper so so they showed that uh, the wave function corresponding to these particles these two particle can be written like this as well as this so this this is the same wave function written in the momentum basis and in the position basis uh, so it's a very simple wave function now if you if 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 you, if i just look at this wave function and and interpret it first let's look at this function which is written in the momentum basis uh, this wave function is corresponding to the first particle this one is corresponding to the uh, second particle so if you read this we find uh, that this is the uh, momentum eigen vector of the first particle this is the momentum eigen vector of the second particle so what what we see is that if we make a momentum measurement on the first particle and if we find that its momentum is k then we know for sure that the momentum of the second particle is minus k so although the, these two particles separated but if we make a measurement on the of the momentum of the first particle we find it to be k the other one is guaranteed to be minus k just because of the, uh, of this wave function now let's say if we write this wave function in the position basis i mean we, we can we very easily show that it can be written like this now this time we have this uh, dirac delta function which has the which are the position i can get and now the interpretation is that if we now make a position measurements and if you let's say find the first particle to be at x then the second particle is guaranteed to be at x plus a okay so it is the same of a wave function these two particles have gotten separated there is no interaction now between them but apparently it 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 seems that if i make a measurement i mean i mean after the particles have gotten uh, kind of separated from their you know birthplace now if i make a measurement of momentum of, on of the first particle and find it to be k then the momentum of the second particle is minus k that means if i know the momentum of this one the momentum of the second particle is is just uh, uh, just there i just know it with perfect certainty but at the same time if i decide not to look at the momentum but to look at the position of the first particle then i find that the position of the first particle is also known because if i find it to be x the other one is x plus a so this is apparently in in violation with how we understand the uncertainty relation because these particles have already 
uh, left their birthplace. So e their, their, their individual wave functions are fixed. If they are in position eigenkate, they will go as position eigenkate. If they uh, are in momentum eigenkate, they will continue in momentum eigenkate. But what we find here is that by making a measurement here, I'm fixing the wave function of the second particle. That means if I make a momentum measurement here, I, I'm making this particle to be in its momentum eigenkate, and that's why I get the momentum value as minus k. And if I'm making a position measurement, then I'm making this particle to be in its position eigenkate, and that's, that's how its position is fixed to be x plus a. So in this sense, if we look at the uh, conditional uh, uncertainty, In this sense, there is a condition, this side is being cut. So maybe, uh, I hope others can uh, maybe see it. So uh, there is a conditional uncertainty here that uh, the, the conditional uncertainty of the first particle, uh, given that the second particle has all, the position of the second particle already been measured, and the conditional momentum uncertainty of the first particle, given that the uh, momentum of the second particle is already measured. Now this can actually be less than h bar value. In fact, it can actually be zero. For, for this way, these wave functions, this wave function, it, it is actually zero. So, so this aspect of quantum mechanics, that uh, uh, the, the, the wave function, which, are, which was legitimately constructed from the uh, quantum principle, this apparently violates a, this uncertain relation. And that was just completely, uh, just not acceptable uh, to, to Einstein, Borowski, uh, Rosen. So at that point, they asked this basic question that is, Quantum mechanics complete uh, because if 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 the first principle is violated in this example, then it seems that there is some problem with the theory. So then they came up with the idea that maybe we need to uh, 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 add some additional hidden variable to the theory to explain such measurement results, so that there is there is no seemingly non-local correlation appearing in the theory. So, so this was the starting point of kind of uh, uh, quantum entanglement, which actually started from a doubt uh, in, 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 in the theory itself. Okay, so before I go uh, too much into the, the, the theoretical aspects, which I will do in a moment, I just want to kind of uh, uh, connect it to the real stuff that yes, so such sources of entangled photons are available and people are actually uh, working with those. There are several uh, such sources available, but I'm only mentioning one that is used in optics quite often, and that is called parametric down conversion. So parametric down conversion is actually a non-linear uh, process, non-linear optical process, uh, in which one has a kind of a chi-2 crystal. Again, one does, uh, we don't need to go into what is chi-2. Just a, a non-linear optical crystal. Uh, the, one of the property is, is that it, it, it absorbs a UV photon and in, in turn, it gives out two red photons. And these two red photons are apparently entangled. Again, what that means, I will get, get in a moment. And whenever one talks about entanglement, at least two particle entanglement, one always talks about coincidence detection. That means looking at both these particles at the same time. So that is the coincidence uh, uh, detection uh, uh, with, with respect to which one always refers to any measurement result that one sees with these uh, photons. So here, this is one example of two entangled photons. One can have two entangled electrons, two entangled atoms, two entangled, and there's several sources, but this is just one uh, 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 that is there in optics, quantum optics, uh, based on the nonlinear optics, and which I will be actually mostly focusing on. Now in parametric down conversion, there, there are a few references. I, I actually have several references throughout the uh, presentation, uh, which people can use later, uh, uh, see later. Now, uh, the, the, the very basic of what is entanglement is, is, is can be written by, uh, the, in, in, in this wave function notation. So here, for example, I have one photon breaking up into two. And if I say that these two are entangled photons, what it means in the, again, at the very basic math level is that, the, the joint wave function of this two photon, if it cannot be written as the a product of the wave function of the individual photon, then these two photons are called entangled photon. This is a very mathematical statement. This, uh, this is also called the inseparability. So as long as the wave function of the two uh, entangled photon cannot be written as the uh, product of the individual uh, uh, photon wave function, then you can say that these the two photons are actually entangled. Now for the parametric down conversion, the 
you have conservation of momentum. That means these two are produced, but they, they uh, satisfy the conservation of, uh, this is the transverse momentum of, that means the transverse momentum of signal, this one is called signal, this one is called idler, the first photon. And the photon that hits the crystal, that's called pump. This is just the historic, uh, uh, the names given. So, so the, the, the sum total of the, uh, the transverse moment of signal idler has to be equal to the pump. So that is a conservation of momentum. They also satisfy conservation of energy. That means the sum total of uh, the energy of these two has to be equal to this uh, energy of the moment. Here, here I must mention that uh, the I can be anything. This conservation just restricts that the sum has to equal to omega P, but omega S and omega I independently can be anything. So this is a very broad band photon. This is a very broad band photon. This is a very, very narrow band photon, but these two are entangled in, uh, uh, well, we will get to that. The other thing that uh, 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 they have to follow is also the conservation of orbital angular momentum. That means the orbital angular momentum of signal plus the idler has to equal to the orbital angular momentum of the pump photon. So I think just a very quick thing because many people may not be aware of the orbital angular momentum of photon. So when we say orbital angular momentum of photon, one actually refers to uh, like a electromagnetic mode and, and more specifically to the Laguerre Gaussian mode. And in, it was shown in this paper that for Laguerre Gaussian mode, if you, if you collect enough energy density so that the total energy is, is, is H bar omega, then for that much uh, energy, the total orbital angular momentum is L H bar. So in that sense, the per photon, there is a H bar L energy in the Laguerre Gaussian modes of this photon. So when we say uh, uh, orbital angular momentum of photon, we mean that per H bar omega energy, the, the, it has a L H bar uh, orbital angular momentum. Okay, so as I said, the, there are other method, methods of producing entangled photon. For example, there's something called four wave mixing, which is a chi three process, but there are other processes as well. We have semiconductor superconducting uh, qubits. There's se several other platforms nowadays, but I will only be concentrating on, on, on optics and even in optics, just parametric down conversion. Okay, so now uh, uh, again, to just give a broad idea of, of what, what is entanglement. So, so these, these photons are first of all entanglement in position and momentum. And what that means can be written in terms of the EPR argument that if the conditional uncertainty, position uncertainty of w w first particle put and conditional momentum uncertainty of first particle, if the product is less than h bar by two, then we can say that they're entangled in position and momentum. So not only position momentum, these photons can also be entangled in time and energy. And the argument will be same that the, uh, the, the uncertainty in the arrival time of the first particle, uh, after we know the arrival time of the second particle, times the uncertainty in the energy of the first particle, once we know the energy of the second particle, the product has to be h bar by, uh, less than h bar by two. And again, for the, uh, you can have entanglement in angular position or by angular momentum as well. So I think, again, people may not be familiar with this orbital angular momentum. So when we say angular position, I'm, I, I, I imagine a circular slit. And in that, and, and in, that, uh, in, 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 in that circle, if you cut a slit, then the angular position of that slit, that is what we refer to as angular position. This, this is just an angle analog of uh, a position and, and orbital angular momentum plays the same role as kind of momentum. And again, it has been shown that the angular position and orbital angular momentum, they form a Fourier pair. Uh, so, so just like position momentum, one also has this uh, conditional uncertainty relation in, in orbital angular momentum and angular position. And if that is violated, that means it is entangled in angular position orbital angular momentum. So these are all referred to as continuous variable entanglement because again, uh, position momentum, these are all continuous variable because uh, uh, well, Except, except L, which is actually discrete, uh, but, but phi, which is angle, that is again a continuous. So, so this all falls within what is called continuous variable entanglement. Uh, now, in addition to condi continuous variable entanglement, there's an entanglement in polarization as well. Now, this is polarization is a two-dimensional basis, a two-dimensional degree of freedom. And this entanglement is referred to as two-dimensional uh, entanglement. There, there, there are other examples, for example, spin, uh, which is like, like equivalent uh, to, to kind of polarization. And you can have in atomic system, you can have three level uh, atoms, four level atoms, and there it will be, uh, you know, uh, three level entanglement, four level entanglement. But this is one concrete example of discrete entanglement. These are uh, continuous variable entanglement. 
now uh, uh, what what it means what entanglement really means again i will try to first convey uh, uh, this through polarization entanglement because it is relatively simpler uh, and i think i'll try to convey it through the argument that einstein porowski and rosen uh, kind of forwarded and and uh, uh, so let's look at this wave function suppose the wave function of this two particle uh, can be written in this form now this wave function has two terms h s h i and v s v i uh, so this is a two particle wave function this is also a two particle wave function and this psi is a superposition of these two two particle wave functions this wave function uh, uh, this particular term means that if the signal photon has polarization horizontal then idler is guaranteed to be horizontally polarized and this part of the wave function says that if the signal is uh, uh, vertically polarized then idler is guaranteed to be guaranteed to be vertically polarized now one can actually show that this wave function can actually indeed also be written as 45 45 45 45, 45, 45 with the simple transformation so now it means that uh, uh, for this wave function if we look at the polarization of these photons in the 45 minus 45 basis then if we find the signal to be 45 degree polarized and the idler is guaranteed to be 45 degree polarized and if we find signal to be minus 45 degree polarized idler is guaranteed to be minus 45 degree polarized so so this is a very simple uh, entangled wave function in polarization in fact it's a maximally entangled uh, state in polarization that is that is one example so so with this particular example i will try to kind of uh, uh, convey or uh, the the sense of entanglement through kind of uh, negating things and through the same argument that epr we are actually using so let us do uh, let, 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 let us do an experiment so this experiment is that this is a source of entangled photon it, it it produces entanglement and here i am make measuring the polarization of the photons polarization of this one polarization of the 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 other one now in addition in in parallel i have a different way of doing things as well in this one i don't have a source a single source of entangled photon right R rather i have two separate sources and each each source produces one photon okay now i can have several connections i can hiddle variable case several very very complicated although but classical uh, connection be between the two sources so several rules i can have between them and that's how they can also uh, they can they can produce these two photons so now the task is that uh, suppose we are given this measurement outcome about the uh, uh, about a certain experiment and that measurement outcome is that somebody finds that if the signal photon in this experiment has horizontal polarization then the idler photon also has horizontal polarization and whenever a signal is uh, found to be uh, to have vertical polarization idler is also found to have vertical polarization now this this is the measurement outcome now one has to kind of uh, the challenge is to design an experiment that will actually produce such measurement outcome now first we will do it quantum mechanically so quantum mechanically it is very easy if this is the wave function entangled photon wave function then it will actually produce this measurement outcome that means whenever i measure a uh, signal and find it to be horizontal i let is guaranteed to be horizontal whenever i measure signal and find it to be vertical i let is also vertical now the question is can i produce the same measurement outcome using such an arrangement that means having two independent sources which may have may or may not have uh, you know connections but having these independent sources and the answer in this case is yes so what are the rules that will actually produce this measurement outcome and still be independent sources so suppose if we have the rule between these uh, sources that both these sources emit simultaneously and emit the same polarization so this is a photon gun this is a photon gun and the rule that i have the the gun needs to be kind of fired simultaneously and if this one is firing horizontally polarized this one also is, has to fire, fire horizontally polarized if this one is firing vertical this also has to be vertical and the second rule is that 50% although it's randomly but 50% of the time this has to fire both horizontal and 50% time both both have to fire uh, vertical now with this rule i can get exactly the same measurement outcome that what are the rules the rules are the both for both the sources are, are emitting simultaneously and randomly 50% of the time on an average both emit horizontal and again randomly 50% of the time on an average they both emit vertical and with that one can actually very uh, uh, easily see that this will actually produce the same measurement outcome so then the question is is this 
this kind of correlation, this kind of measurement outcome, does it indicate entanglement? The answer is no, because I can actually uh, do it through such as uh, arrangement as well. Let's take another example. And this time I'm doing my measurement in the 45 minus 45 basis. The polarization, polarizers are at 45 minus 45. And the measurement outcome one has is that if the signal photon is found to be with 45 degree polarization, idler is also with 45 degree. If the signal is with minus 45, idler is also found to be minus 45 degree. How do I do it quantum mechanically? Well, this wave function will do it. If I have a source producing this kind of wave function, then that is guaranteed to give me this measurement outcome. How do we do it uh, uh, classically using these two independent sources? Well, again, the very similar rules, both source emit simultaneously, uh, the same polarization, 50% of the time, 45 degree, 50% of the time, minus 45 degree. And these three simple rules will make sure that one, is, uh, one, one has the same outcome through uh, the, 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 these two independent sources as well. Now, is this entanglement? Well, of course, no. Okay, let's look at the third example. Now, this time, the measurement outcome is that, uh, if the, that somebody measures is that if the signal photon is horizontal, idler is also horizontal. If the signal photon is vertical, idler is vertical. At the same time, if the signal photon was measurement in the 45 minus 45 basis, then, and if the signal photon is found to be 45, then idler is also 45. Signal is minus 45, idler is also minus 45. So they are connect, correlated not only in horizontal vertical, but also, but also in 45 minus 45 at the same time. Now, can we do, can we reproduce this measurement outcome uh, quantum mechanically? Yes, it's the same wave function, as long as I can produce the same wave function, because this wave function can be written like this as well. And so this just satisfies, uh, you know, uh, 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 this measurement outcome. Hence, this wave function quantum mechanically will actually reproduce this particular measurement outcome. Now, the question is, can we actually do it uh, reproduce this measurement outcome using two independent classical sources uh, and the, this is a challenge and in fact if anybody can do it uh, well this cannot be done uh, this actually uh, uh, so if, when i do it in the class usually i give students few minutes to kind of think and uh, they come up with answer usually it just cannot be done uh, the the one of the particular uh, 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 suggestion that students would actually come up with is that Maybe this time we could do 25% of the time, you know, horizontal, 25% vertical, 25% of the time, 45 and minus 45. But that does not work. Uh, the reason for that is that if I have, if suppose these two are producing two horizontally polarized photons, 45, uh, two horizontally polarized photons. But if I decide to look in the 45 minus 45 basis, now since this was horizontal, there is a 50% chance that I might get it in the 45 minus 45 basis. So if this is horizontal vertical, then there is a, there is a, a finite probability that I might get, end up getting a 45 here and a minus 45 here, okay? So, so this perfect correlation that whenever it's a 45 here, I let it also 45, that cannot be reproduced. So then is this entanglement? And yes, this is entanglement. So if I can sum this up in uh, like a one sentence, as to what entanglement is. So entanglement always is a simultaneous correlation in two separate conjugate bases. So for example, in the case of polarization, horizontal vertical and 45 minus 45 basis, these are, these are two conjugate bases. And if one has a, a, a perfect correlation in both these bases at the same time, then that is entanglement. Any classical source with any sort of complicated rules can never ever produce this. So, so this is that uh, the existence of simultaneous correlation in two kind of conjugate bases is, is, is what entanglement is. But, 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 but this effort of having independent sources and but building some complicated rules between them to actually reproduce the quantum result, that actually was the path suggested by Einstein, Prolsky, Rosen, and that actually was a path taken by David Bohm in, in 1950s. In fact, he produced several papers where he showed that this actually might actually be possible. But there was no way of kind of testing as to what Bohm was saying was right or wrong, but because the hidden variable theories, because the variables were hidden and they could be as many, so it was very difficult. So in 1964 then, Bell, John Bell, he came up with an inequality, with a very definitive inequality. And he then showed that if his inequality could be violated, then hidden variable theories cannot be correct. So if there can be any experimental result showing that the Bell's inequalities are violated, that actually would mean that the hidden variable theories just cannot work. 
and then you know the the experimental effort started and then now we have several experimental violations of bell inequality and this actually is has still not stopped people are still doing a more and more refined versions of bell inequality and frank kind of like uh, saying that any hidden variable interpretation of quantum mechanics uh, just doesn't work okay so just give you some very uh, uh, basic idea of what what bells in again this is a very very uh, uh, mathematical uh, stuff so i actually will not go into it but well just 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 give you a flavor of what actually is bell inequality so in bell inequality you actually uh, consider an experiment in like a, uh, a two dimensional basis like a polarization basis and then you construct a quantity called s which are like uh, separate measurements e e e settings and s is uh, you know it's just just this it's just just a mathematical quantity and each of this quantity is basically based on you know these measurements that you make now n is the coincidence measurement that the joint probability of detecting signal at alt polarization alpha and idle at polarization beta and so on so forth so you get this quantities through experiment and then through this you construct this quantity and uh, for for certain set of parameters what bell shows that if this value has to be less than any for any hidden variable theory and if this value can go up to 2 root 2 for quantum mechanics so if two particles are quantum correlated they can yield value of s up to 2 root 2 but if it's only hidden variable type theory in the value of s maximum can be 2 so this was a very definitive theory and then using such uh, uh, entangled state people actually showed first in 1981 using atomic cascade and then using parametric down conversion later that yes bell inequality is indeed violated and 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 uh, so that was probably the end of uh, the this local hidden variable interpretation of quantum mechanics that it is now kind of well understood that yes you can't have the local hidden variable interpretation of quantum mechanics and that entanglement or, or the other quantum entanglement is 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 there for real okay so uh, uh, let me go back to these are the, uh, the the different types of entanglement that i was actually referring to and then now uh, i then i start with the polarization but now people have shown bell inequality in these variables as well although bell inequality was for two dimensional basis only then how do you do the bell inequality with uh, a continuous variable so you do it by uh, kind of uh, discretizing the the basis this is uh, in a sense uh, ma making a small subspace and actually showing this is this is, i i would say not you know proper bell inequality violation proper has to be uh, in the polarization basis but nevertheless even by making a two dimension subspace people have actually shown the violation of bell inequality so here by choosing two different directions for the uh, uh, parametric down conversion photon uh, in this paper people actually showed you know you make such a state where this whenever signal is the momentum p1 idler is p2 signal is p2 idler is p1 this is kind of like a, a, a polarization type uh, maximally entangled state and people have shown bell inequality violation with that people have also shown it with uh, time energy entanglement where you choose uh, two different frequencies such that it gives you the same polarization entangled type state and again it can be done again it's a very complicated experiment i won't go into that but i'm just saying it it actually been done as of you know 2009 uh you can also have bell inequality violation in angular position orbital angular momentum uh and here there's a state that is made in the orbital angular momentum basis again it's a two dimensional uh, subspace in which uh, in, in in which it has been done and again uh, let's not go into the details of the experiment but yeah this is how Uh, it actually can be done now uh, we started with the epr paradox uh, so so and that is the the uh, the real thing that one has to test when it's a uh, continuous variable entanglement so so for position momentum entanglement it has actually been shown that uh, uh, the epr uh, e, 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 the conditional uncertainty is actually violated now in this experiment they actually uh, measured the position by by putting a tiny this so this is again signal idler signal goes this way idler goes this way and by putting a narrow slit here you find the position of signal and after mm -hmm. measuring the position of signal you just scan the other slit to see what is the uncertainty of the idler uh, photon and this is the position conditional position uncertainty of the idler photon 
Similarly, you do an experiment where you find the uh, first measure the momentum of this one, and then uh, look at the momentum uncertainty of this one, and that is the uh, this is the experimental result. And the product of two these two widths were found to be 0.06 h bar. So of course less than uh, less than h bar by two. So th this was actually the first uh, demonstration of uh, EPR paradox, uh, that is the violation of conditional Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Very similar experiments were done in time energy entanglement and then later in angular position orbital angular momentum entanglement. Again, uh, some complicated experiment, but this is the uncertainty in orbital angular momentum. This is the uncertainty in angle, conditional uncertainty. And if you take the product, this was found to be 0 0.15 h bar. Again, that violates the conditional uh, uh, Heisenberg uncertainty. So this all proves basically that, uh, uh, yes, you have entanglement. And one thing that comes out uh, as, as regarding what entanglement is, is that you have to have simultaneous correlation in two different conjugate bases. Here, one has correlation uh, in X as well as in P. And, and the, the, to show it, you, you, it, it has to be less than H bar by two. This actually, theoretically, it can actually be, I, sorry, not theoretically, but ideally, it can actually be zero. So you can actually have India have perfect correlation in both X and P, which are the two uh, kind of conjugate bases. Okay, so, so once we know that the entanglement is uh, uh, conjugate, uh, the perfect correlation in two different conjugate bases, uh, people then started thinking that, okay, now uh, what do we do with the entanglement? Uh, so I will list out a few examples of, of the different applications that people are thinking and so people are kind of working as well. But I would say there's still a long way to go uh, regarding all the, any of these applications to actually become a, a reality. So first, uh, I will kind of uh, uh, produce, uh, uh, introduce the idea of quantum lithography. This was actually uh, based on an experiment which is called Honger-Mandel effect. So first, let's see what is Honger-Mandel effect. In the, this is a very simple experiment. In the Honger-Mandel effect, you have these two entangled photons arriving at a beam splitter. And then they go in different direction and get, then get detected at the detector. And then you move this beam splitter to introduce some distance delay between these two arms. So what are the possibilities for these two photons? So the possibilities are that both the photons can go transmitted or both the photons can go reflected or both the photons, uh, one goes transmitted, other goes reflected and the vice versa. Now there are all these four possibilities by which these two photons can get detected at these two detectors in coincidence. But it turns out that when this X is zero, that means when this path length and that one is exactly equal, then these, the probability of these two happening becomes zero. And so you have just these two, uh, 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 you know, the possibility that only these two can happen. So what does it mean? It means that if the, both the photons are arriving simultaneously at the beam splitter, then they kind of like get bunched together and both of them either go this way or both of them go that way. So if you actually look at the coincidence within the photons as a function of X, then you find that there is a zero in the center. When X is zero, there is no coincidence. And at that point, at that exact point, uh, both these photons are either going this way or going that way. Now this fact can actually be utilized for doing quantum lithography. And uh, again, very basic sketch I will do. Uh, I'm not sure if the people can see uh, uh, this side of the slide, but here is a, a beam of light come, or there can be two beams of light, they split into two, and then these two beam get, uh, 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 get combined. And usually, and you have a lithographic material here, and depending on the light intensity that the fringe that light forms, you the, the fringe pattern actually gets written on that uh, material. And that's how lithography, the entire semiconductor industry, this is exactly how it works. And how fine a pattern you can write says that, you know, how small a chip uh, uh, or, or how many transistors in a chip one can actually fit. So th this is as a function of X. And usually what decides the minimum size is basically the wavelength of light. And once the wavelength of light is known, the minimum size that you can do is already fixed. So, so for a given wavelength, let's say, uh, if, if you, uh, if, the, if this is, this is uh, let's say for the classical example, if you have a classical light or one photon light, then this one photon will either go this way or that way, and then they combine and give you intensity pattern, which as a function of X is one plus cosine two KX, where K is the direction here. And so this is the kind of pattern that will get written on that lithographic material, because this is the intensity. Now, if you have 
this hongo mandel effect that means if you have one photon coming this way one photon coming this way and the paths are balanced then you have two photon going this way or two photon going this way again let me just uh, say it again that i have this uh, dark red and this lighter red this says that these two photons arrive and now i have either this one happening or that one happening not both at the same time so both the photons either go this way or go that way and in this case if you, you can actually show through the simple math that uh, the the intensity that gets written is 1 plus cosine 4kx instead of 2kx so now with the same k wavelength i can write finer pattern twice as fine on the lithographic material and if you continue this way with n entangled photon one can actually go cosine 2 nkx so this is the n four lithographic resolution enhancement that if you have n entangled photons here then you can actually enhance the res uh, lithographic resolution by n fold at the same wavelength so this was the idea of quantum lithography people are working on it there are some uh, 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 you know progress there are some problems as well but this is one very actively pursued idea uh, uh, area then there is quantum computation again i will not go much into it because it is a huge field and what i'm just trying to kind of uh, 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 we, we will try to kind of point out that for any computation what you need is what's called a qubit state and since it's a quantum entanglement here we have two qubit state one qubit means a two a particle which stays in two dimension for example transistor is like a bit which is like zero or one and qubit means a quantum bit where it can be zero one zero plus one all kinds of superposition two qubit uh, two qubit means the two separate uh, 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 particle and each is in this two so once you have such state then you can do uh, kind of computation so i'm just trying to kind of a uh, uh, list here that what are the different bases in which these two qubit states have been successfully made first is the polarization basis that people have successfully shown that you can actually indeed make polarization uh, qubits this is again the paramagnetic down conversion photon you choose the polarization basis and actually you can can actually do it uh, the two qubit states have also been made in the uh, what's called time bin basis this is a little strange basis but apparently this the, this has uh, 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 several benefits in 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 a long term uh, sorry long distance quantum communication so here if you look at this setup the basis here is just the uh, kind of a, the direction in a sense uh, which is the temporal uh, size and in this in this case i can have both these photons going this way that way or like this way and that way so the basis become long long and short short So all this is a very strange basis, but people have shown that you can use this basis even to do. Okay. okay. So uh, other than that, you can also have the qubit state in position. There, it's like uh, uh, the, the row S one, row I one, row S two, row I two, and we can also have it in the uh, angle basis. so i mean several bases you can use any basis one basis will be useful for some application other basis will be used for some other application so but but people have now shown in all these bases that one can actually make two qubit states uh, again it is not just two qubit people have actually shown that we can actually have two qubit space that means not necessarily two dimension but you can have d dimensional state and now people are working on on having n q dit space that we have n independent uh, 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 particles each existing in d dimensional space and all entangled and then try to kind of do things with that so those several progress uh, actually uh, much progress have, have been actually made in this direction but again i'm not uh, going to all of that the other application which i think people are much more excited uh, is this quantum cryptography and this seems that this probably will be uh, the first application which probably will uh, become a reality maybe very soon and the idea is actually very simple uh, here uh, one has uh, uh, these two entangled photons signal idler now alice is one party this is the uh, alice and bob these are the two particles used in in, the, in this quantum cryptography language so alice is one party bob is one party and what they are trying to do is to do quantum or do cryptography between them which essentially means they actually want to share a secret key or rather they want to share a key in a secret manner and that key is just a string of numbers so how do they do it so the arrangement is that you have this uh, two photons entangled in polarization so i can write this state as h h v v 
or I can also write this as 45, 45, minus 45. So I'm writing 45 as D, there's a diagonal, and minus 45 as A, this anti-diagonal. But it's the same state, I can write this in H and uh, HB basis as well as in DA, that is 45 minus 45 basis. And if I get a, uh, a photon with a horizontal, I call it zero. If I get a photon with a diagonal, I call it zero. But if I get it the vertical and uh, uh, anti-diagonal, then I call it one. Okay, so both Alice and Bob will make independent measurement. Again, no joint correlation, nothing. The independent measurement they will actually make. And then later, they will talk to each other to decide what measurement they actually got. So here is a scheme. Now, Alice is going to choose her basis randomly. That once the photons are out, she will then decide by flipping a coin or something as to whether she wants to do uh, a measurement in the HB basis or in the diagonal anti diagonal basis. Similarly, Bob will decide his basis randomly. That means whether he wants to look at an HB basis or diagonal anti diagonal basis. And they are not talking to each other yet. So, completely randomly and independently. So suppose this is the string of kind of basis that Alice decides. This is the uh, uh, string of basis that Bob uh, decides. And suppose these are the numbers that get. That means when Alice chose the DA basis, she actually got the anti-diagonal photon. That's why it's one. Next time uh, when the D2 photon came, she chose the horizontal vertical basis. And this time she got horizontal photon and that's why it's zero and so on and so forth. Now, first time when Alice was using DA, Bob actually happened to choose a horizontal vertical basis and he, he happened to get the horizontal photon that's why it's zero. Second time uh, Bob chose uh, again HV and he happened to again get zero. So this is the string of basis they chose uh, Alice, Bob and these are the string of numbers that uh, Alice got and this is the string of number that actually Bob got. Now one thing to see here is that only when they happen to choose the same basis the HV here, HV there their measurement outcomes will be correlated. If they happen to choose two different bases, then the measurement outcomes need not be correlated. For example, if, 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 if both Alice and Bob are working with this wave function, then whenever Alice sees H, Bob has to see H. Whenever Alice sees V, Bob has to see V. Or whenever they're working in DA basis, the results are correlated. But if Alice makes a measurement in H, V, and Bob makes a measurement in DA, then the results need not be, they can be correlated, because it, it might happen 50% time, but they need not be correlated all the time. So, so once this is done, then Alice and Bob get over phone and then they only talk. They don't discuss what bits they actually got. They only talk which basis they used first time, second time, third time, and so on. So then Alice and Bob, they discovered that, okay, first time they did not use the same basis. So, so they will just discard this result. Second time they use the HV basis, both. Hence, they will keep this result, which is zero. Third time, again, they happen to use two different bases, fourth time, two different bases. The fifth time is the same basis. So this way, they only keep those measurement outcomes when they happen to use the same basis. And in this case, in this particular uh, simple example, this we, we see that at the end of it, we get a 0011, 0011. So although this string of number 0011 was never discussed between Alice and Bob, they actually ended up with exactly the same string of number. And this is the idea of quantum key distribution that you ended up uh, 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 kind of sharing, secretly sharing this, this, this uh, 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 string of numbers, which is again, just, just a four digit, but this is just to kind of uh, uh, give the basic idea. Now, again, I'm just, I have just in the very, very basics of, uh, you know, quantum cryptography. So this is the basic idea. And this idea works because of something called no cloning theorem. And those are the supervision principle in quantum mechanics. Now, somebody can actually try to poke in this one. And the, the, the main difference between quantum crypto cryptography and classical cryptography is that in quantum cryptography, if somebody tries to uh, get and look, try to look to the, into the measurement, then this perfect correlation of 0, 0, 0011, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, that actually will get disturbed. So once the Alice and Bob have finished this part, they will actually, they can actually check few of their bits. Let's say here I have only four, but suppose they have 40,000 bits. Then they can look at some hundred of them and then they can see if there are any errors in those bits because the idea there should be no error. So if there is error, then they would know that somebody has actually tried to eavesdrop in the system. And that's how the quantum cryptography is perfectly secured that if somebody tries to eavesdrop, the user will actually get to know. 
and and there are ways of ways to actually correct that what's called error correction uh, protocols but if the if the error in the bit is up to certain extent then it can actually also be corrected but the main difference from classical cryptography is that classical cryptography is in principle can be broken but but quantum cryptography cannot be broken i mean if somebody tries it one would actually get to know and just if you get to know you can just discard that particular measurement result okay so that's quantum cryptography uh, and uh, people have actually shown uh, to some extent uh, the quantum cryptography this was in uh, 1900s and more recently people showed quantum cryptography over like 144 kilometers uh, well this is a lot still need to be done but this is in principle people have actually uh, are shown there's a uh, now even more recently as of 2017 people have actually shown this quantum key distribution between uh, uh, ground to satellite station this was uh, uh, done in actually uh, 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 one group in china they actually uh, did it so th th this has actually been shown as of 2017 that yes one can actually do gr uh, ground to satellite quantum key distribution as well uh, finally uh, there's one last application i would like to talk which is quantum teleportation now teleportation uh, it's a sometimes also a popular idea kind of a, so when we talk about quantum teleportation here we are talking about teleporting a state again this can have a lot of application but i'm not going to go into all that but the very basic idea is that suppose there's a particle called alice there's another particle called bob and if alice has a quantum state she might not know exactly what that quantum state is but if alice has a state and if she wants to send that state to bob uh, then then it actually is possible if they share an entangled pair between them. Again, this is a, a completely, uh, it, it has been shown theoretically and then experimentally as well. But the idea is that Alice basically wants to send an unknown quantum state to Bob, but, and they can actually do it if they, in addition to this photon, if they share an entangled pair, then they can actually do it. And this actually has a lot of application because there is a no cloning theorem in quantum mechanics that says you cannot really uh, make a clone or you, you cannot make a copy of, of a photon and make it, you know, or you, you, you cannot clone an arbitrary state of one. You can always clone a particular state, but you cannot copy an arbitrary state. So this is also uh, kind of being pursued uh, pretty heavily. And as of 2012, people have shown quantum uh, teleportation over 143 kilometers. Again, this is a very, very, you can see this very, I, I'm just putting this uh, just to show that this is a very complicated experiment, uh, but the point is that yes, they actually have uh, shown. So yes, people are making a lot of progress in this uh, in this direction. Okay, so to kind of sum up and summarize and just uh, to give you the uh, uh, current status of this field. So there are still uh, several foundational questions in this one and then uh, several application among the foundational. One is still trying to understand what is non-locality and what is physical reality uh, because uh, we understand reality in terms of real numbers but in quantum mechanics, it is not always so. So what then happens to the notion of physical reality that people are still trying to understand? The physical origin of correlations uh, between this entangled particle, uh, uh, also how this uh, that particular correlation actually decays. And finally, how to quantify that correlation, how to quantify that entanglement in, 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 a, in a quantum state. This is, this is a very, uh, uh, you know, this is a very important, the, the EPR paradox that I showed, that is just a witness that shows, yes, there's entanglement. No, there's no entanglement. But how much entanglement, that is a completely separate question. And there's some progress have been made, but again, this still needs to be uh, uh, done. This has not been done for a generic quantum state. For very, some very simple quantum state, one can actantly quantify. Now in application, again, there's several applications, quantum information, quantum cryptography, teleportation. And now the challenge is to prepare this two qubit state and qubit state and then they are you know more and more efficient and improved ways of making this entangled quantum state and then uh, uh, people are looking for applications in quantum meteorology quantum remote sensing so uh, i mean this area uh, certainly touches both foundations and, and and next generation kind of application so with that let me thank you all for your attention and also if anybody wants to kind of uh, uh, have any question later uh, you can email me at this uh, uh, ITK, and you can also visit uh, my web page uh, if, if you are more interested in this and to know exactly what we, I have not presented my own research, but if you're interested in that, you can actually visit the web page as well. So, so with that, let me thank you again. All. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for a very wonderful, exciting, interesting and exciting talk, sir.
Thank you. Really, we appreciate uh, you explain the quantum entanglement and the latest applications. Wonderful, sir. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much, sir. And sir, we will have a now question answer session. Mm -hmm. So I request uh, uh, Dr. Pandya, uh, Jignesh Pandya, to conduct the session. Over to Jignesh Pai. And remaining, we will send you in the mail later. Chiknes, uh, bhai, please speak loudly. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, there are some questions already uh, listed in Q and A session. Uh, you can please uh, pick up some from them and uh, answer yourself. Or should I pick up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can pick up, and uh, remaining questions will send to you later. Okay. Yeah. Also, oh, okay. So, should I go uh, uh, the serial wise? No, no, no. You can pick up any you want, any of the. Things oh, I see. Are. Well, I can go serial. That's okay. So, the first yeah. one, first one I see is how how position is certain in diffracting waves. Well, uh, the uh, position is certain only in the to the extent of that uh, size of the slit. At least at that slit plane, one knows that the 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 particle of the photon must have come only through that narrow slit. So one does have that information that if one detects the photon, its position at the uh, location of the slit must have been only through that narrow uh, opening. Otherwise, it would not have made it to the other side. So that's how uh, uh, one says that the position is not certain, but position is certain to within that size of the slit in diffracting waves. Yes. So, how do I know that people are convinced? I think I can just go to the next question, no? You can go to the next question, no problem. So, okay, okay. Uh, so the next question is, uh, does anything happen in the space between the entangled particles? Uh, okay, so I think uh, the question kind of like means that is there any connection uh, between once the, these two photons have left their source, is there any uh, thing that actually really happens between them? The answer is actually no, as there's nothing physical uh, that happens. Once they are separated from their source, there is no interaction uh, as such that happens between them. They can go, in fact, uh, the, there was the EPR's argument that they can actually go to different galaxies. That means they are now space-like separated. But even, if, even then, if you actually go and measure the correlations, you will still find that they are correlated both in, in simultaneously in position and in the momentum basis. So, so nothing happens between them after they have uh, gotten out of the, the, the source that generated them, but they remain entangled nevertheless. Uh, the, the next one is how you pretend or say about non-local uncertainty product, please clear this equation. Uh, okay, so well, what I did is a little bit uh, quite hand wavy, not doing uh, completely uh, uh, the, 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 the math properly, but I was, I was just trying to convey the idea that uh, uh, it is not the violation of uh, uncertainty, it is a violation of seeming violation of conditional uncertainty. So if, and that means in, in uncertainty, we say that uh, we take a particle and we say that, okay, what is uncertainty in its position and what is uncertainty in its momentum and what about their product? Here, what we're talking about that once I make a measurement of the first particle, then what is the uncertainty of the second one? And suppose if I make a measurement of momentum of the first particle, what is the momentum uncertainty of the other one? And that product seems to kind of violate Heisenberg uncertainty. And that is what one does that. The, the main thing the main thing to get kind of disturbed or that's what uh, was disturbing to Einstein Podolsky Rosen is that once the particles are out, either if the first particle, either it has to be a plane wave or a diffracting wave, it cannot be both at the same time. Once it is out from the source it, uh, that produces it, it either has to be plane wave or it has to be diffractive wave and so for the second one. So, so if I make a measurement, I should get that I that particular eigenstate uh, only will, but if what what it turns out that depending on the measurement on the first particle, the other one we find it to be either in the momentum eigenket or the position eigenket, and this simultaneous possibility with hundred percent probability that is completely you know baffling as to how that happens, and that was the uh, main point of uh, EPR 
but people have actually shown experimentally that yes, it does happen. Uh, okay, the next one is, can two different kinds of particles be entangled? Uh, yes, uh, two different kinds of particles uh, can be entangled. People have actually done experiment where people have shown that they, you can have photon and atoms getting entangled. So, so as long as you can define a wave function of two different particles, you can also write a state which is superposition of uh, superposition of uh, 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 you know superposition state of those two particles, and hence it can be done. So that is theoretically, but experimentally also it has actually been shown that you can have atom photon entangled. We can actually Google atom photon entangled and actually see it. Uh, Dr. Cha, yes, uh, I think there are more than 70 questions right now. Okay, and it won't be practically possible to answer all of them. Okay, so we'll compile the questions and then send it to you. Then we can communicate that thing to participants later. Fine. Fine. So I think we need to close the session here for Fine. question Fine. answer. Fine. Yeah? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much, Dr. Jignesh Bai, sir. And once again, thank you, Dr. Anand Kumar, for a wonderful talk, sir. Uh, friends, uh, for the second session, uh, we have a INSA teacher awardee, uh, Professor Praful Keja, another Anand, Professor P. Keja. He will deliver a talk. Uh, I would like to request uh, Professor Arun Pratap, sir, to introduce uh, Professor P. Keja for his talk. Thank you, sir. Over to Professor P. Uh, Arun Pratap, sir. Thank you, Dr. Tusar Pandya, sir. It's a pleasure to introduce another Jha. So it's uh, all Jha here today. And uh, uh, Professor S.C. Varma sir told about the entanglement between him and Dr. Anand Kumar Jha, that both were born in Darbhanga. And I can see the entanglement between Praful, uh, Praful Kumar Jha and Anand Kumar Jhaji, that their hometown, home village is in Madhubani. Uh, both of, uh, all of us know, are aware of the Madhubani painting. So just like that, uh, uh, we had a beautiful talk from Dr. Anand Kumar Jha. Thank you, Dr. Jha, for accepting our invitation and delivering a very nice and lucid talk. Uh, we have another, uh, Professor, uh, another Professor Jha, Professor Praful Kumar Jha from our own university, that is Maharaja Sayaji Rao University. He did his uh, MSc from Pune University, now Saitri Bhai Phule University, Pune University, PhD and PhD from Bhopal University. He is, as uh, Dr. Tusar Pandya said, and he himself is an INSA teacher awardee. Thank you, uh, Professor Jha is an INSA teacher awardee. He is also associate of ICTB and TWAS. Uh, uh, Professor Jha has uh, his research interest in many areas, broadly speaking, condensed matter physics, and he, to be a specific in nanomaterials and the first principle calculation of phonons fa phase transition. And he has more than 300 research papers in journals of international repute, and he is member of editorial boards of so many journals. Uh, he is a fantastic teacher and a, a very active researcher, producing so many good quality papers every year. And I, I personally, he is a good, very good friend of mine. And uh, 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 without wasting much time, I will request him to start his uh, talk. And let me tell you that these two talks, apart from the first two days when we had uh, the foundations, foundation lectures on quantum mechanics, we have today the application part. So the first part that is quantum entanglement was very nicely covered by Dr. Anand Kumar Jha. Professor P.K. Jha or Praful Kumar Jha, he is going to address another very important aspect or application of uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, that is the uh, use of density functional theory or first principle calculation to the uh, materials design. He has uh, some very good papers in all leading journals with impact factor as high as 10. So I now request uh, Professor P.K. Jha to start his talk. Professor Jha. Right. 
Uh, I at the outset I would thank I would like to thank uh, Professor Arun Patab, a good friend of mine, and of course all uh, organized member of the organizing committee like Professor Joshi Pura. I can see Professor Pankaj Joshi, Kusar Bhai, Dignesh Pandya, and uh, um, others. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I would like to congratulate Professor Arun Patab for selecting this particular topic that is on the quantum mechanics. And uh, in fact, when I choose this, that is application of the quantum mechanics to the material science. And after listening to a half days, in fact, five sessions, uh, I also was thinking that, okay, I should have selected some other topic of the quantum mechanics. But anyway, this is uh, something which is the application of the quantum mechanics. And that is also an important thing. As far as the quantum mechanics things are concerned, uh, in the last uh, two, three days, two, two and a half days, in fact, you can say, uh, very wonderful lectures we have heard, all right, uh, right uh, from Professor Lokanathan, Professor Ghatak, then yesterday we had two lectures, very nicely presented by Professor Joshi about the cosmology, and then on, on an uncertainty principle, Professor Kodubare gave a very excellent talk, and today, uh, Dr. Anand Chha on uh, quantum integrity. In fact, this is not my area, but I have heard today and uh, understood many things, right? In fact, uh, it was not possible earlier to spend time, but today I have heard him and uh, really explained very nicely. As you can see, I will uh, share my screen. Right? I just Right, I hope you can all can see my presentation or the PPT. Is it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes. I hope it is me on that uh, screen. As you can see, the applications of quantum mechanics and machine learning methods to materials. In fact, uh, before that, uh, it's a small gathering. In fact, has a. I, I think this is just uh, casually it has happened that uh, we three four. People are from the same place, right? Uh, in fact, I never knew that Professor S.C. Barma is from Darbhanga. Uh, in fact, the people like him cannot be of a single one place, but uh, he's a national person, national hero kind of thing. But still, I am delighted. I was not knowing that he's from Darbhanga. I was knowing that he's from Patna also. right? So anyway, it's a very good uh, uh, opportunity. In fact, you can say that uh, presenting uh, something before him. And as far as Anand Bihai is concerned, uh, long back, maybe in 2014 and 15, I met Professor Manoj Harbola, who came here for uh, one program which I was organizing on DFT. And that time he did mention about him, but uh, we never met or never saw each other. In fact, today we are seeing each other because of this webinar. So this is uh, again a very as far as the quantum mechanics is concerned, in fact, my topic is on the application. So I will come to that that's a little late uh, after one or two minutes. See, the quantum mechanics has many facts, but three facts I would like to say. One, that this theory, that is quantum theory or quantum mechanics, what we say is the most fundamental theory of physics at all the modern theories in last uh, several years. And uh, many discoveries, many theories which have come later on follow this. This is one thing. Another thing is that it is very counterintuitive. That means that it is not based on the intuition like classical physics or classical mechanics. So it is counterintuitive. And then the, it is based on the experimental observation. That is many theories of the quantum mechanics have been developed based on the experiment, then theory is developed, and then the third theory is used for the prediction of other properties or other characteristics. And that is what is the uh, topic of uh, today for uh, my presentation. Uh, this is a very known fact that age of new material, this slide is also very common. But what I would like to say that uh, material science has been always uh, and instrumental in shaping the 
the mankind development that means basically the society you can say civilization and all other things and therefore it has always been in the focus for science scientists and the researchers to develop new materials with new properties and uh, in fact i would like to add here that as we know that in the Avogadro number you have 10 to the power 23 atoms and therefore you have always have the possibility to tune the properties of the material by displacing uh, any of these atoms and therefore the possibility is always there and as i said it's directly related to the human civilization and uh, sustainable sustainable development of the uh, society you can say or the mankind and uh, this is what started from the stone age and but in the present days or in the future as we know it is the era of uh, nanomaterials biomaterials and other things but apart from that also that the high typical superconductivity multiferroic material supportological in insulator and many other materials which are existing at present are the backbone of the development of uh, instrumentation or maybe several other things. Uh, my topic, as I said, this is basically on the density, it is popularly known as the density functional theory, that is a methodology to characterize the material, uh, to know its characteristic, and then, of course, based on this, and if it is combined with several new techniques such as nowadays the machine learning which is a based on an art uh, based on artificial intelligence it, it is quite helpful in predicting the new materials with new characteristics and the most advantageous thing with the machine learning is that it saves time uh, and we, just uh, one example which i will take in the uh, last just that tells that uh, only 2% of the time which normally the DFT takes such in doing those calculations is uh, being used in the machine learning. That means 98% time is reduced if we use the machine learning methods to predict or find the new, new material. So that is what the, at present the combination of density functional theory, which is just advanced quantum mechanical method, you can say, combined with the machine learning or any other several um, uh, other methods for the search or uh, um, things, uh, several new materials can be predicted. So that is how I, I thought to combine both. In fact, uh, in this one lecture, it is not possible. Uh, normally, when I, I, I unfortunately teach this at our place, and this is for the whole semester, so I have tried to combine in one hour. Uh, and just only one or two slides, I will show that how machine learning, what basically it does to predict the material characteristics. Right, so as I said, that density functional theory is nothing but an advanced quantum mechanical method, quantum mechanical methods to characterize the material's properties based on uh, the density of the ground state as one of the criteria, and that we will discuss. So this is basically what it is uh, something which is breakthrough in the material science. And in many cases, right, uh, it predicts the material for better characteristics or better properties. For instance, uh, topological insulator, which is a very good material, and at uh, present, people are a lot of people are working in this. This has been predicted first by the theory, in fact, the density functional theory, and then it was. Uh, experimentally observed. So it helps not only in characterizing the material, but in several times it is predict in predicting the material. And as I said, that by co after combining what people nowadays do, that after combining with the machine learning language or maybe any other advanced techniques like based on the artificial intelligence, uh, people predict several materials for uh, better applications. So in fact, you can say that this density functional theory is nothing but an electronic structure problem of material. When it comes to the electronic structure problem of the material, then as we know that materials are made up of electron and the ion, ions are heavy and electrons are lighter. And therefore, all the properties of materials can be attributed to the complex behavior of electrons and nuclei interacting each other. And when it comes to the, or in fact, uh, anything beyond hydrogen and helium is very difficult to solve. But in some analytical way, we can do for the hydrogen and helium. 
and since this is at a very small scale level at the level of electrons and nuclei ion and therefore it can only be solved with the quantum mechanically or it can be given with the help of quantum mechanics you can say that only quantum so it's it's not the classical mechanics problem it is the class quantum mechanical uh, problem just before coming to the actual dft i will just go quickly to the evolution of this uh, electron structure theory uh, first time or in the beginning in the of the 1900 uh drood and lorent basically gave the theory uh, to understand the electron characteristics electron properties or maybe the uh, characteristics of the material based on this they assumed that metal metals contain free electrons that move in the background of the positive ions and that was popularly known as the gigium model or the free electron model and uh, but this this model did not consider or does not consider that is the electron ion interaction electron electron interaction and assume to move as independent that is based on the kinetic theory of gases so the basic uh, disadvantages and advantages of these were that uh, this model helps to understand some properties of matter such as conductivity of the material but fail in explaining the specific heat at the low temperature that is anyway we know that um, that is basically the reason one of the reason that the quantum theory basically and that is what we study in our early of the early studies of the quantum mechanics i think that is a specific heat at low temperature is explained by using the then this theory was uh, modified by the summerfield and uh, he introduced or he incorporated the pauli exclusion principle Fermi Dirac functions and explain the specific of solids at low temperature and wide. But uh, this also has some failure that in predicting, explaining many other properties, including why the materials are semiconductor or insulator. That means it was not able to differentiate the materials in terms of the semiconductor, metal, and insulator. That is what uh, then. after this in 1928 the bloch theorem which we all popularly know whether you have studied the quantum mechanics or condensed matter physics that the bloch theorem so the that was made by the bloch and explain why certain materials are insulated and uh, why certain materials are metal and then what he used he applied constraint on the form of electronic wave function which defines a quantum number k uh, the schrodinger of course schrodinger equation was solved and then for an electron moving in a weak periodic potential could be solved by using nearly free free approximation free electron approximation and uh, then as we know that if psilum that energy versus k that is band structure uh, can be obtained important consequence of the periodic electron ion potential was that uh, electrons are allowed in certain energy or energy bands and some are forbidden in certain forbidden and those bands are called as the energy band gaps in simple way we can say that these energy gaps or forbidden energy gaps are such in which we do not have the uh, solution of the schrodinger equation you can say in general right so if the number of electrons in matter is such that occupied bands are completely free it is an insulator otherwise it is metal as we know so if the gap is uh, a small that is less than two electron volt we normally call it two it is not very specific it is semiconductor this is because it could have a small conductivity at room temperature due to thermal excitation of electrons across the band so this is what is the band structure you can say parabolic band structure right without any free elect for the free electron case e is equal to h square k square by 2m right then uh, we come to the quantum description of metal materials so as we know that atoms are made up of nuclei and electrons and therefore different kinds of interaction exist in them that is materials are complicated collection of electrons and uh, those things you can say that uh, there will be coulomb interaction let us have repulsive coulomb interaction between electron electron positive that is electron Ion and uh, so on. 
right? So as I said, that uh, it is repulsive Coulomb interaction between pairs of electron, repulsive Coulomb interaction between pairs of nuclei, attractive Coulomb interaction between electrons and nuclei, and those uh, expressions are given in this side, and we'll just combine, and then we can solve it. So, um, I think I was mentioning in the beginning that uh, advanced quantum mechanical EFT model it is nothing but it is uh, a modified Schrodinger equation. And therefore, we can say that Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation basically contains everything of the material if we can solve it. So, Schrodinger equation is exactly solvable for two particles analytically and very few particles uh, numerically. So this is how uh, we, we can write and to solve this for a real system, we need approximation and uh, density functional theory is based on one kind of or in fact on the approximation because it is impossible to solve at least at this moment solving the equation completely. Therefore, it requires the approximation. So if we write the potential, right, of the real material, real system, then you can see that it has the kinetic energy term, it has the electron-electron interaction, it has the ion-ion interaction, and then of course the electron-ion interaction. So it is density functional theory is a general thing that is, it is solution of the Schrodinger equation in approximate form. And as I said, that sorry, it, everything of the material has or it contains in the Schrodinger equation, and we need to solve it. So, basic point is that only, and therefore we require the. Since uh, you can see in the uh, uh, previous slide that how complicated that equation is for the real system, and therefore it requires some approximation. The first approximation, basically, to solve this equation was uh, given by the Born-Oppenheimer and that basically is popularly known as the Born-Oppenheimer approximation and this is based on the uh, mass or other you can see the dynamics of electrons and nuclei which can be decoupled due to the heavy mass of nuclei in comparison to the electron right and uh, as you see that therefore the velocity or the speed of the particle that is electron and ion will be different. Ion will, are very heavy, therefore, uh, they can be considered as an uh, static in comparison to the electron, or rather, you can say that the electrons are moving in the background of the ion, right? And this is shown in this picture where this elephant means that is the uh, ion and in a small bees are the electrons. That means basically what? And uh, just you can imagine that on the head of the um, elephant, some honey is attached, honey is kept, and therefore all bees basically fixed near this head of the elephant. And if somehow the elephant disturbs the position, then they get disturbed. But after that, again, they come uh, closer to this uh, head of the elephant. That means basically this elephant, which are iron, are the background of the um, bees, right? So this is how basically we can say, and that is how it is said that we can now decouple this uh, dynamics or the motion of the bees and the electron by considering uh, most uh, bees and the uh, elephant, that means electrons and the ion. That is what, so nuclei are much moving much slower than the electron, right? And in some cases, we can basically, in approximation, we can consider their ideal, right? So, as I said, that we have to solve the Schrodinger equation. So, in solving the Schrodinger equation, ion can be taken as a stationary and uh, in the ionic part in the Hamiltonian can be neglected. And uh, therefore, this whole thing can be solved by using the separation of variable problem. That is one for the ion, another for the electron. That is what it is shown that phi is the combined wave function, chi i is the uh, wave function for the ion, and the uh, psi e that is the wave function for the electronic part. 
So this is how it can be separated out. We have the ionic part on the first equation, and then the second part is the electronic part. So solve electronic equations assuming fixed position for the nucleus, right? So this is what uh, basically some beginning, or in fact, you can say that's early uh, approximation of the uh, Schrodinger equations to solve the complicated ion or the electron nucleus problem or maybe the materials problem you can say right so uh, this of course was applied and uh, it was uh, able to give the exact solution only for one electron system main problem was the very complicated electron ion interactions with the glue and therefore this was suitable for semiconductor or insulator because ionic motion does not affect the excitation of electrons not suitable for metals because in metal band gap is zero so ionic motion can excite the electron so extra care is required that means some to the some extent this way was successful in giving the then uh, another approximation to solve the Schrodinger equation in fact i will say was the hearty approximation and this equation is in fact uh, equation is known as the hearty equation by solving this equation we get the value of energy and the wave function and uh, this basically reduces many electron problem to one electron uh, one electron problem you can see that the hearty potential depends on the solution itself to solve this a gas value is required for potential the procedure is repeat until the that means basically it is a self consistent procedure is applied to solve this however it has certain uh, disadvantages and those disadvantages are, are basically that for one electron theory electron moves as an independent particle and such that it includes the effect of correlation of electron that means it includes the electron electron interaction only in average manner and another important thing is that it does not consider the anti-symmetric nature of the uh, wave function that is for the electron and that this anti-symmetric nature of the electron were con was considered by the hearty fog of course uh, together with some other approximation and uh, then it was solved by using the slatter determinant and uh, this is what it is so hearty approximation works well for atoms however the form of wave function uh, is not correct and the method fails for molecules in 1930s fog and Slater basically fixed this problem, as I said, that is they use the anti-symmetric nature of the wave function. So if we have our trial wave function as a determinant, that condition of anti-symmetric nature of the wave function will be that which is satisfied by the Slater determinant, which gives the determinantal wave function size. So this is basically the below one is the hearty fock equation i'm not going into detail of course but uh, you, you can find it in any of the condensed matter of quantum mechanics book right so this is here the first uh, uh, this term you can say it is the hearty potential and then it has the additional term that is known as basically the exchange energy or exchange this method reduces many electron problem in one electron problem in which electron moves in the field generated by others but it ignores Coulomb correlation between the parallel spin electrons and gives rise to the exchange interaction. So what it neglects or what is what are the weaknesses of this that it neglects the correlation between opposite spin electrons. That means basically it takes care of only the parallel spin electron. When applied to the free electron model, it gives pathological uh, result, uh, path, uh, results as the density of states are similar near the Fermi level or the Fermi uh, state. Since the many body wave function involves the coordinates of all the electron, it is a, uh, sorry, right? So where the n is the number of, this approach is complex and computationally costly right and uh, it's certainly not accurate enough for most applications in chemistry very bad for solids right that is band gap is too high lattice constants is too big cohesive energy in metals 
much too low. That means all the basic properties or ground state properties which were calculated using this were not up to the mark, right? So that is what. So how to get this wave function based approaches that is configuration interaction, couple cluster are accurate but expensive. Then it was the methodology that is that has come that is then CT functional theory or DFT, which is formally exact but more efficient. And in fact, I should uh, caution that this is also uh, the approximation or this is also based on the approximation, but it is better. It is uh, it, it depends on uh, the functionals and all the things that will come later. So it also has the uh, drawbacks and those drawbacks are basically overcome by the proper selection of the exchange correlation functionals, right? Oh, okay, uh, this uh, uh, is how the density functional theory is uh, getting popular. A very successful approach to calculate the ground state properties of uh, many system. Solution of the solving that equation for many body problem. This is also several times it is combined with the word Evinicio first principle. That means did I Evinicio means uh, it is first principle. That means you don't require much information to be supplied for the calculation of the properties, right? That means in a simple word and in a single word, you can say doesn't require any empirical parameterization. And therefore, uh, this uh, is more accurate and precise than the Hartley fog and the post Hartley fog and many body interaction model, right? So, and uh, you can see here the popularity of this. In fact, uh, to 2020, it is somewhere now this point because yesterday only this, I could not change it, but it is around uh, 8,000 or 8,500 papers in the 2020 based on the density functional theory, right? What basically DFT does. So DFT is, uh, is uh, a formally exact representation of the n electron Schrodinger equation and that we can see if we have the Schrodinger equation this is something like this right which is formally equivalent that means it is it is Schrodinger view it is dft view and as i have said that still, it's still it is the um, approximation only so electron electron interaction external potential these are all some nomenclature here then in the DFT, it is basically con some particle and non-interacting effective potential. It is easy problem to solve. This scales like NQ. That means basically what the while in the case of artifog and other many body things, it is the three n degrees of freedom that n is the number of particles. This reduces in the density functional theory or the DFT. It is to the three, and therefore it reduces time computational time of the system tremendously and if you and as i said in the beginning people are still trying and that is why the machine learning method which is based on artificial intelligence is being used for uh, the uh, material materials characterization or the materials new materials prediction and uh, it, it, it saves time tremendously in fact the two percent of the time is only used for the from in comparison to the actual DFT calculation. So first principle calculation, fundamental laws of physics is satisfied by that, no empirical input. That means uh, you have no adjustable parameter. We use electronic charge, electronic mass, atomic numbers, and uh, masses of constituent atom of the matter. That means set of some ex accepted approximations to solve the corresponding equation as on a computer. So it has great predictive power to predict the material or the properties of the materials, right? And of course, as I said in the beginning, or maybe a couple of minutes back, that it also is based on the approximation and therefore it depends on the proper selection of the exchange correlation based on that the all characteristics will be decided by the material or, or, or when it gives the correct answer. 
Uh, see, this is why it is a Thomas Fermi model. We all know that it is first to use the electron density as the basic variables. And therefore, the Quenberg and Korn were considered to be the father or in fact, the, of this development density functional theory development. And then later on the Korn sum, they used this concept of the Thomas Fermi model. That means where the energy is the function or energy depends on the density of the um, a system or density charge density of the system. So this is the basic equation of Thomas Fermi theory and the equation which is extremely simple to solve. The equation in terms of electronic density depends only on the R that means on the position. Right. So uh, in simple word you can say it is basically the functional of some functional and the functional means that means here the functions of the especially distributed charge density right so this is what is the basic concept so the concept of this char electron density was introduced in the density functional theory that is in by the uh, Weinberg and Korn and then the Korn sum uh, was based on the Thomas Fermi model and we popularly known the uh, homogeneous gas and, and homogeneous gas and then it is how basically it is just to have you the idea that how the electron density came into the picture of the density functional theory that was basically from this that is how the energy is depending upon the density of this based on that in the when bar con gave two theorems right and uh, that was the basis or the of the density functional theory development and one that is number one is that the external potential vr is a unique functional of electron density nr right that is the total ground state energy e of any system is unique functional of nr right that means this is first that is e depends on density that is energy is unique functional of density the functional E n for the total energy has minimum equal to the ground state uh, energy at ground state density, right? So the ground state energy E can be written like this. And uh, therefore, you have the functional uh, function of n of r that is density can be expressed by this expression and here you can see that the first term is nothing but it is the kinetic energy of the non-interacting electron gas of density nr in its ground state while the second term is classical coulomb energy and the third term is the exchange correlation and it's a very important parameter as i have been continuously telling you this exchange correlation energy is something which matters a lot in the day of the calculation and uh, starting from some simple functionals uh, exchange correlation functionals people have come now to the long way for very advanced functionals of course they are very time consuming and uh, computationally very costly so that is what it is so con sum equation based on that when bar con theorem the con sum given equation uh, derived in fact that Vxc is known as exchange correlation potential which is most important and here you can see basically that this equation is quite similar to the Schrodinger equation right and uh, this equation is known as the Quonsam equation and uh, psi, con, psi r e and v effective are Quonsam orbital that is solution of the equation you can say Quonsam energy and the quantum potential respectively, right? That means this is V. So you can say basically that the uh, dynamics is solved under the influence of the effective potential. So if you have the correct effective potential, you can uh, have the correct prediction of the characteristics or the properties of the material, right? That is what self-consistent process, how basically this is solved. You can say that you have, we start uh, uh, the exchange is known and un unknown and for that some approximation is used and the most simple one is the local density approximation which is given by this that means in local density approximation it is in a simple word we can understand that the density is uniformly distributed at a local point right then uh, to consider the spin effect we have the local spin density approximation is very similar to that where n 
up and then down is basically the density corresponding to the up is spin and density corresponding to the down. Then, uh, of course, this was a very simple one and uh, therefore some and it was not able to predict the correct characteristics of the material and therefore the another approximation was considered that was a generalized gradient approximation as my name suggests it is the gradient that means the density is not locally uni uniform at a single point rather it is gradually changing that means certainly it, it will be better because it considers in the whole FAA spectrum. In the left hand side uh, uh, graph it is how basically the self consistently consum equation is solved that is shown here that we start with the initial gauge value of the wave function and uh, that calculates the energy density then we take the exchange correlation and then calculate the energy force if uh, because as say it is self consistently that is if it's not sati it is not satisfied then we go to the another wave function and then the whole process is repeated till we get the correct energy and the correct force right uh, this is uh, of course many times the pseudo potential is used and as we know that to replace complicated effect of non balanced electron and nucleus with effective that is basically you can say the effective potential they are of two kind i am mentioning this because those who do the dft calculations they know that is they you have to select a pseudo potential that they can be of the non no conserving then you have the and the ultra soft and uh, both ha have their different utility based on that basically they uh, sell it right now we move slightly towards the application actual application of this uh, some equation i will call or maybe the dft uh, it can at least at this moment it can be calculated or it can be used for the calculation of almost all type of character properties of the materials right as i said in the beginning the basic characteristic or the basic aim of this dft calculation is to, cal to perform the electronic structure calculation that means to have the electronic structure of the material as we all know that anybody who develops first the material they go basically to calculate to to understand its structure and then its electronic characteristic that means whether the material is semiconductor insulator or metal and this can this can be obtained or this can be seen by using the electronic band structure that means a relation between energy and the wave vector k and uh, that basically gives us that is whether the uh, material will be semiconductor insulator or the metal depending upon if it has the uh, band overlap band gap at the fermi level or not so the so first thing that every uh, in, in dft calculation is done that is we calculate the structure and compare with the experimental observation that means basically the xrd data and that is the lattice parameter then uh, a structure related other parameters maybe the bulk modulus etc etc so those things which are obtained from the x-ray diffraction or xrd maybe the neutron diffraction that can be directly comparable can be compared by the optimization or the minimum energy configuration of the structure so that means basically we do the minimization of the energy and then we proceed for the property calculation so first thing is the minimization in energy which gives a lot of information regarding the structural characteristics or the structural behavior of the material then as i said that the basic purpose is the electronic structure and therefore they give the electronic properties electronic characterization that means whether the metal semiconductor and then several other things and then it goes for the several properties right i have mentioned here the vibrational spectroscopy as we all know that is the vibrational spectroscopy basically gives information the about the phonon dynamics in the material right and therefore that phonons are what that the phonons are nothing but the quanta of lattice vibrational wave in the material so observation of vibrational modes that is in phonons in crystal normal modes in molecule is a powerful tool in materials characterization many of us or many of you must be knowing that you have the infrared effect spectroscopy you have the uh, raman spectroscopy you have the billion 
scattering, they basically gives the information about the phonon through experiment. And nowadays, then uh, you have the neutron scattering, which gives you the full phonon dispersion curve and phonon density of states. Uh, so you, you, you can have these information from the experiment and therefore to understand those experimental observation or to match to understand with the theory or you can say in to predict in the some cases you require to calculate the or to do the vibrational calculation or phonon dispersion curve calculation phonon calculations and uh, that is how basically phonon calculations in the material particularly after coming uh, after the discovery and being a lot of work being done in the two dimension material it's is also being used heavily to know whether the material is stable dynamically stable or not and therefore if you perform the phonon dispersion calculation from the dft then if you have the all phonons with real frequency in the billion zone you can say that this structure is stable and that is what is basically done in the case of prediction that means we want to predict a material that we have to calculate some basic characteristic and then the phonon dispersion curve to know whether the material will be existing material can be synthesized in the laboratory or not that means it helps in predicting the materials and therefore it can be developed in the laboratory so vibrational spectroscopy is a sensitive probe of the atomic structure and the chemical bonding and thus of the electronic structure right most frequently used experimental techniques as i said it is a neutron scattering that means technically difficult the entire dispersion is observable infrared spectroscopy raman spectroscopy then it is the billion scattering and then in some cases see the x-ray is also being used so, so uh, theoretical calculation of vibrational mode frequencies and intensities from first principle is very helpful in analyzing the vibrational spectra right and uh, as i mentioned somewhere there is a machine learning therefore with the help of machine learning uh, you can uh, maybe at that point i will tell you how, how it can be done so you can know that whether the material should exist or not or you can predict the new material right so um, to calculate the phonon you have two different techniques that is frozen phonon techniques which is based on the finite differentiation of the uh, forces those who are doing the dft calculation can immediately realize that uh, there are several packages which uses this finite differentiation of method and the several that is a direct calculation of the second order derivative of the energy so this is basically you you say that the density functional perturbation theory so there are two methods frozen phonon technique and the dfpt method through which the phonon calculations are done uh, as i said that we are using density functional theory because it we have to consider the contribution from the electrons but otherwise there is another method that is also known as the molecular dynamics that can also be used to know the phonon dynamics or the vibrational spectra of this and for that it is a very simple you don't have bit idea about the molecular dynamics can immediately know that by calculating the velocity autocorrelation function you and then using this formula you can know the for uh, vibrational frequencies or the frequency spectrum of the material so i will skip this because this is just a textbook material for that this is for the frozen phonon and uh, these things uh, how basically the density functional perturbation theory is used so i will try uh, with the help of phonon as i said that you can know several information about the material not starting from its uh, possibility to be synthesized in the laboratory that means in terms of its dynamical stability but also it helps us to understand the phase transition in the material it helps us in several thermal properties of the material for instance the thermal conductivity now it is another very important topic for the thermoelectricity and therefore this thermal conductivity is a very important parameter of the material which can be understood which can be calculated 
after calculating whole phonon dispersion curve in the Bilon zone. Then, of course, several uh, of optical property that means you can calculate the effective uh, charge are related to polarization P induced by the lattice distortion. This is a typical phonon dispersion curve. And all you know that the upper one is the optical phonon, lower one is the acoustical phonon, and uh, they both contain several information about the material, right? In the right panel, it is a density of states, right? And you can see here what I was mentioning that uh, all phonon frequencies are positive, right? There is no negative imaginary phonon. So therefore, the particular material which is mentioned here is uh, a stable in a given condition in which it has been calculated, right? So this is how it, right? So like, I will also, then you can calculate the infrared cross section and therefore you have the IR spectra. So by using this uh, phonon calculation, you can express, you can find the infrared spectra of that and that can be directly comparable with the experimental observation. Similarly, you can calculate the Raman cross section, that means Raman spectra, right? So um, I am not going into a detail of this kind of calculation, which are, you can see in the bottom of uh, this, that is how it is calculated. But uh, by calculating the Raman scattering or cross section or the Raman spectra in the solid, you can know a lot of information. You know that is how Raman uh, spectroscopy is important for the materials characterization, right from the simple inorganic solids to the organic or the biomolecular uh, biomolecules or biomolecular solids, right? So therefore, the DFT has also this uh, uh, capacity to calculate the Raman spectra, infrared spectra through the phonon uh, calculations, you can calculate the mechanical properties, you can calculate the thermodynamical property. So as I said that you can calculate all sort of properties related to this. All sort of properties are now possible to calculate by using the phase, um, the, uh, the density functional theory, right? Now here, just I have given one example. In fact, this is our results only. So we calculated the Raman spectra of this uh, delta phase of ALOH, which is a material which is normally found in the uh, earth core or earth mantle, which is supposed to be, uh, it, it is known to be carry the water in the um, uh, earth core or earth mantle. And uh, we, we, we basically try to understand two things. One, that is its stability. And then, of course, the uh, uh, understanding of the some particular oxygen hydrogen stretching mode. So here you can see this is the calculated Raman spectra by using the density functional theory approach. And then at uh, zero GPA you have, then you have the uh, five GPA, you have the 15 GPA. And as going from uh, 0 GPA to 15 GPA, it shows a uh, phase transition from PT1 NM structure to the PN NM structure. Both are orthorhombic only, right? So, but two different group symmetries. So, it is able to help you in understanding the phase transition through the Raman spectrum calculation. What I want to say that experiment is experiment, right? You cannot replace experiment by any theory because that is reality. But with the help of this density functional theory, you not only you can understand those characteristics, but also you can predict the or you can calculate the Raman any characteristics and you can compare in the future or at least you can know that in what condition it is going to so what right. So as I said that it is we can understand the phase transition. In this case, it is delta phase of ALOS, but in any material. In fact, I have done lots of material in which phase transition is calculated by using the density functional theory or maybe even with, with the model calculations. Then another material, which because uh, I mentioned about the imaginary phonon, and therefore you can see that this is another compound, HCO2. This is popularly known as the delacoside. 
uh, compound which have great application in the case of solar cell to many other right and uh, you can see here that this also exists in two phases right one is in the 2h phase another is the 3r that means it is tetragonal and it is hexagonal so you have at zero gpa if you calculate both and the beauty of this compound was that the energy is so uh, close that it is there is a confusion that in which phase is basically uh, exist right so you can see here that in this zero gp all phonon modes are positive right so that is 2h phase that is hexagonal phase it has all phonon uh, frequency that is positive so it is a stable while it is in the 3r phase it is not that good but still you can say because if you have the good computer better i mean the, if you spend much more time then perhaps this can also be made uh, positive in the bottom if you what you see here right and the, in the bottom at gamma point right then but anyway right when it goes from 0 gpa to 35 gpa you can see here here that there is the significant or in fact some negative phon or imaginary phonons which can be seen in the this particular uh, uh, inset similarly when you go for the 3r phase it is at 40 gpa calculated and here you can see there is a significant imaginary phonon point is basically what that phonon phonon freak, uh, from the phonon calculations we can know that how uh, um, to know the phase transition in the material that is how it is going right and then uh, the same thing here by using the Ramon spectroscopy you can see here that the zero gpa it is a 2h phase it is a t3r phase and the both have the different uh, Ramon spectra that means Ramon peaks here and as you go from uh, 0 gpa to 30 gpa in this case you can clearly see the shift in the phonon frequency while in the case of 3r phase you can see that the another peak which is at a six centi six hundred centimeters fully disappears and in fact i have not shown in detail but point is that at this as we go on up maybe around uh, uh, 40 gpa or so or 50 gpa it turns to the, the another phase that is uh, very, becomes very similar to the another phase which has been confirmed from the excess. So point is that you can know the phase transition in this. You can know that is how the atoms are vibrating when it uh, during the phase transition or when it approaches towards the phase transition. Right. This is uh, another relaphosite um, type of metal, chalcopyrite. And uh, here, basically, I want to show you that we can calculate the optical properties of the material by using the density function theory, right? So then, uh, now I will come to the um, machine learning thing, right? In fact, as I said, that there are large number of properties which can be calculated by using the density functional theory, and then you can uh, use them to predict. Now, I, I, I will focus here in the machine learning that these cal DFT calculated results as a data and then predict the new material, right? So, uh, this is a very general uh, thing that is, as I said in the beginning, it is basically the artificial intelligence based method and which is known as the machine learning, you can say. And uh, model can predict the stability of arbitrary compositions then uh, 4500 new stable compound that means this is just a indicative you can say right as i said there are many properties right from the band structure to the elastic constant to the phonon frequencies to the thermal conductivity but here i am taking application of this machine learning to the prediction of the new thermoelectric material that is how basically it is done Right. So this is right, how basically simple. It, it is said that if you have a very good tested data of in the your algorithm, then you can predict a very good material. So machine learning models need to be able to generalize well and learn patterns well enough from a small pool of available because uh, you require data, right? And if you have large number of data and then predicting 
something of course will be very good but having large number of data is a, another problem and therefore if you your algorithm is good to predict the properties or predict the material from the a small set of data or low a small pool of available training data then it is very good that is what basically it is done right and uh, the, the thing which i am discussing is not it, in this case it is not use much data of course it is not very good but relatively it is but how it is done that is what basically i am trying to convey so the combined data given models were uh, worth physics uh, with physics driven models and the limited data sets and identifying potential thermal so our aim is basically to identify the thermoelectric materials by using the uh, available less or more whatever data you but in this case it is not much so it is basically the regression method where ml models learns to predict the values of given compound at the given temperature and the given chemical potential state right so those who have some idea about the calculation of the uh, thermoelectric parameters in the materials then they can realize that we calculate this zt which is known as the figure of merit which depends on several other uh, thermodynamical parameters that is cb coefficient chemical potential etc etc and uh, so you 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 can basically see that at what temperature or for the which potential state your uh, material is suitable for the thermoelectric application if it is high zt that means figure of merit it is a good uh, te material therefore this can be a descriptor that means this can be a feature apart from the band gap cb coefficient etc etc see uh, what is basically done in the case of uh, machine learning methods to predict the new material that you select the data you select the algorithm you select the features right so here you have the features means that is descriptor so uh, people select band gap cb coefficient chemical potential state temperature etc etc as the parameter or the feature but if we select the zt because our interest is to have the material with high zt then that is also a very good so here in this particular approach zt is also a descriptor or parameter so to to develop the methodology there are three needed key components that is one that is the data for model development model testing model applications right or to search a space descriptors that means the features and then the algorithm right so these three are the important thing how we do that basics of uh, this thermoelectric the thermoelectric materials are receiving wide attention due to their potential role in mitigating global greenhouse effects and enable conversion of waste heat energy to the electrical energy three approaches to find the materials are what that is if i want to have the new materials new thermoelectric material that means one is either you have to do the experiment so traditional experiment is one the b is the physics based computational approaches like density functional theory calculation and the third is the ml machine learning based data driven approach right so you these three are the approaches so the last one which we are just discussing some success with a limited uh, because no much data is available that is what basically means so the traditional experiment you do physics based computational approaches will do so suppose in the third that is the ml based uh, data driven approach uh, you require lot of data so normally people prefer to have the data from the experiment but if it is not available then data can be obtained from the dft calculation how two can be combined we perform dft calculation for number of materials in number of system number of cases or we take from the data uh, storage and then we apply the material ml based data driven approach so that is what basically it is done then in these three approaches what are the limitations in the first case the traditional experimental approaches are not efficient way of exploring the unknown chemistries right and the focus mostly on modifying the known materials by nano structuring to make these or maybe to alloying this so that means you have a material and you want to modify or you want to have the better te material therefore you you will either nano structuring this or maybe alloying this or maybe doping this and then with this limited 
approaches you will try to find a new te metric here then uh, uh, dft calculation so high fidelity physics based models like dft are computationally prohibited because you require a lot of computational cost as i said that you require uh, it's a dft is not a simple calculation in many cases for which suppose you want to do the phonon calculation for very big system it requires a lot of computational uh, resources so this has another problem therefore for many machine learning obtaining bountiful data is an expensive process right so machine learning has only disadvantage that if you that you don't have data if you have the sufficient data then this is the best approach and as i said in the beginning it saves time tremendously right that means only for some example <coughs> This is these are the machine learning algorithms in materials, right? So regression, as I was mentioning, that I will using or just discussing then the classification of learning. So these all is available, uh, or people uses people use any of these methods or the um, to predict these things, right? so here it is basically the band gap uh, predictions i will not go into the detail but like thermoelectricity uh, thermoelectric material determination you can have the band gap prediction that means here the descriptors will be what the band gap so or uh, many other things right uh, similarly uh, and based on that you can basically calculate the several uh, system here it is basically the super cell kind of thing is given right so you can uh, predict the band gap as i said in the previous case it was the uh, thermo electricity just uh, i will uh, mention that suppose you have a 115 materials let us consider in 115 materials you want to perform it maybe for uh, 50 chemical potential state 15 temperature so multiply all these things this will be a data set then suppose you are trying to identify it with respect to the 50 descriptors right so then you you will have the that multiplied by this as a uh, data set and therefore this whole data set Or suppose 115, as I said. So suppose I will take 90% as a test data, and this 90% test data will give the output, and then based on that, the 15% which is left in this 100 or in 10%, whatever it is, it is left will be predicted, or based on that it will be predicted. So it helps in uh, predicting a uh, new material. based on the data available from the density functional theory and then applying any of the known or convenient algorithm from the uh, machine learning to develop the materials right so uh, thank you very much i stop here in fact this is a very long topic i have tried to just make it uh, in a 40 50 minutes right yes sir thank you very much sir for your excellent interesting and very informative talk you gave a nice uh, review of a density functional theory and well said that this theory is very efficient general and popular to compute the physical properties of the material uh, thank you very much sir for a very interesting and exciting talk really you inspired me also to use uh, first principle calculations i use uh, pseudo potential methods but i don't do the uh, first principle calculation you inspired me thank you very much sir for an excellent talk and now we will have a question answer session i request uh, uh, jignesh bhai uh, to conduct the session over to yeah. jignesh bhai ha uh, sir uh, there are 14 questions right now in question answer session so uh, if you want you can select some of them or i can select for you now i will select some and then you can yeah, yeah sure uh, that will be better sir that will be better and sir uh, the first question is uh, that uh, uh, can the machine learning algorithm help us with the high temperature superconductivity right sir sure because uh, as i said in the beginning 
that you can apply this machine learning algorithm if you have the data corresponding data either from the dft calculation or from the experimental thing you can certainly predict the uh, high temperature superconducting material because you require in that case only the data right for instance here you have the phonon calculation maybe the electronic calculation and whatever is required you you can select the data set and you can certainly calculate this right and uh, then some of the quantum computing uh, a solution to increase computation power right certainly because anyway the uh, dr anand was speaking something related to this quantum computing only so certainly i hope uh, it is true that quantum computing will be a solution to increase the computing uh, power right uh, we have a number of method numerous method so is there any other efficient way to solving the problem like uh, harmonic uh, oscillator see the this is in fact the high level uh, it, it is a good technique the good method to solve this right and therefore all methods is basically is there that is prior to this and therefore this method you can consider as the best method to calculate this right uh, uh, difference between pz and the pve exchange uh, correlation function this is this is uh, uh, when we talk about the exchange correlation that you have the pz and the pve so in, in, in this one that is a pve what we have the gga gga kind of thing right gga exchange correlation uh, and another is the lda so it is certainly the difference uh, uh, can we use quantum mechanics to depict the interaction between the liquid crystal certainly yes we can use right so which is better if, if i need to explain any models like hubbard models or which is better approximation if i need to explain any models like or uh, this question uh, is unclear to me because like hover model or anything that is what they want to basically compare uh, is there any necessary condition parameters required for a new material discovered proposed to exist or to be considered uh, is there any i see the of course uh, you need to have the material which is uh, stable right and uh, that is why I, if you had remember i mentioned apart from calculating the characteristics properties of the material uh, like suppose i calculate the band structure and it shows that it is semiconductor but whether the material will be stable material will exist material can be synthesized in the laboratory or not that is a different thing and therefore uh, you have to first find that is the material should be stable and that is why one of the method to find the uh, material uh, to be exist or necessary condition that is its stability and therefore we do the phonon calculation we do the uh, calculation of the formation energy and all other so these are some conditions which confirm that the materials will exist then only the properties are important and we call optical phonon and not phonon do why do we call optical on ah uh, 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 optical phonon means that means basically that you can say that frequencies of this lies in the uh, optical spectra or rather you can say that these can be excited by the light right and that is why they are optical phenomena how we can calculate periodic of inorganic molecules using yes we can apply the same but normally the, uh, for all uh, organic com mole mole compounds in fact we are talking about the molecules we we can apply the same uh, periodic binary condition kind of yes, thing sir bas aapka session hai sir to jara wo facebook pe bata dena ka facebook pe sab right so um, you can use the quantum espresso you can use the vast you can use the ebinit you can use the siesta trans siesta but the most popular one are the quantum espresso and the vast they are the most popular packages to calculate these properties but you can calculate by using the ebinitio you can calculate uh, from siesta trans wine 2k and other thing win 2k and all the thing but quantum espresso and the vast are the most popular one quantum espresso is free while uh, vast we have to purchase uh, what are jt value jt is basically the figure of uh, merit 
and that uh, depends in fact i have shown the formula in it that depends upon the several uh, i mean the c wave coefficient divided by the electronic and the thermal conductivity of uh, that i don't know what values you want or that so uh, if you have the high jt value you have the good thermoelectric materials right uh, super cell is basically what that uh, you when you want to perform uh, the dft calculation you for for the simplicity many times we calculate to perform in the unit cell uh, thing for instance suppose you have the nacl and uh, then you have the two atoms per unit cell but in many cases when you require the um, uh, some other characteristics you need to perform the calculation in the super cell therefore we just repeat this in all three direction depending upon uh, what basically you want and how much resources uh, you have phonon as i said it is nothing but the quanta of lattice vibrational wave right it is just like one uh, photon as the quanta of uh, electromagnetic waves it is quanta of lattice vibrational wave and uh, then or in fact you can say Uh, when we consider it as the wave, it is nothing but the elastic wave that we have been studying in uh, from the school days. When it comes to the phonon, that means it is quantized. And uh, if you have done some harmonic oscillator problem, you can just remember. Otherwise, in for simplicity, you can say the quanta of lattice vibrational wave. Uh, see, is machine learning and quantum mechanics future of humankind? Yes, because uh, quantum uh, anything at present or in the future which will come uh, will be based on the quantum mechanical theory and machine learning is something which uh, is very uh, fast coming up to do the things as i, I said that if i do the dft <coughs> calculation it takes lot of time and if i do the machine learning uh, if i apply the machine learning it saves the lot of time therefore the machine learning and the quantum mechanics uh, uh, is certainly the future uh, of uh, human kind or mankind you can say machine learning anyway is coming in all field right whether it's economics whether it's medicine whether it is is everything so you cannot avoid the machine learning things right uh, yes sure is machine learning yeah. help, right so i think uh, you have answered almost all questions sir uh -huh. so i think we can close this session okay yeah. thank you thank, thank you sir you. thank you very much uh, once again professor ja sir for an excellent talk sir it's a inspiring talk thank you, thank you. and dignesh bhai thank you for conducting this session uh, friends now this is the time for a concluding remark of our webinar series and uh, i request our convener sir professor arun pratap sir ji to conclude the session and propose a word of thanks sir over to you thank you to sir bhai thank you sir actually every good thing which starts has to end so that is the story we about this webinar also we started uh, with the lectures of the two stalwarts professor loknathan and professor ghatak on quantum theory yesterday that is the second day we had <clears throat> am i audible am i audible yes 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 uh, so yesterday we had two lucid and nice lectures one by professor pankaj joshi on a field which is relatively not much known to us uh, that but very popular uh, quantum cosmology provost of charu set professor joshi then we had our own professor odbare who spoke on uh, uncertainty principle then today we had two anands dr anand kumar jha and dr prafull kumar jha and uh, this this karyakram ka uh, aagaj itna badhiya ho wo anjam to acha hona hi hai aur wo tab jab aaj ki shobha badhai hamare padma shri professor harish chandra varma ji ne उनका आशीर्वाद हमें आज मिला और उन्होंने आज के पहले स्पीकर को इंट्रोड्यूस भी किया उन्होंने क्वांटम इंटेंगलमेंट पे अपना लेक्चर दिया काफी बेसिक 
था लेकिन काफी अच्छा था और हम समझते हैं जैसा रिस्पॉन्स आ रहा है हम अभी यही देख रहे थे इन लेक्चर्स के दौरान जो रिस्पॉन्स है लोगों का ये है कि ऑल द लेक्चर्स एंड ऑल सिक्स लेक्चर्स इन इन दीज थ्री डेज वे आर वेरी नाइस वेरी इंफॉर्मेटिव एंड दे ऑल ऑफ देम इट सीम्स हैड अ वेरी गुड एकेडमिक फिस्ट विदाउट एनी लंच और डिनर और ब्रेकफास्ट और टी दे इंजॉयड इट सो इट्स समथिंग remarkable something historical particularly the attendance also and uh, professor pk jha talked about another application first application was talked by uh, professor uh, uh, anand kumar jha second one on density functional theory and you can see the power of uh, this theory density functional theory that it can reveal some of the experimental facts or it, it can predict some of the experimental facts which can be later on verified by experiments so this is the power of density functional theory so what i feel uh, on the whole it was a very fruitful webinar and uh, i will say again uh, that uh, not much to take a home balki uh, ye uh, what i will say ki uh, you have lot of home delivery because this is a home delivery again i will repeat everybody is sitting at home but getting at home and not all, 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 even at the door steps but inside your room either with uh fan or with ac whatever in your uh, own sweet home so i will just say uh uh about william wordsworth william wordsworth was a poet who was of sundaryavad you understand what is sundaryavad so he was a very very jolly fellow very pleasant he had his friend his name was very fast friend saint colerich this particular line i am saying about the two uh speakers today eminent speakers today on their names so william wordsworth said that no one completely understood me not even saint colerich was his best friend i am myself one of the happiest of the happiest of the persons that ever lived on this earth so this is a kind of tribute or appreciation for the two speakers today and what to talk about the other stalwarts We, who I spoke on the earlier days then uh, coming to the conclusion i will say that it was all the efforts of our organizing team very efficient team dr uh, tusar pandya uh, dr jignesh pandya dr arun anand and the two uh, prasa joshi pura and the two youngsters uh, harshal and chintan so credit goes to all, all of them and i feel that we will have next opportunity sometimes suppose in uh, in uh, in actual thing we are rubaru jisko kehte hain aapas mein hum milenge aise ummeed karte hain abhi jo sthiti chal rahi hai covid ke karan us par hum ek galib ka sunana chahenge har cheez ki ek seema hoti hai aur wo jab seema par kar jati hai to fir wo चीजें सब ठीक हो जाती हैं ऐसी हम उम्मीद करते हैं तो गालिब की दो लाइन के साथ हम खत्म करेंगे उसका अर्थ यह है कि पानी की एक बूंद अगर समंदर में मिल जाती है तो वो भी समंदर बन जाती है सो उसी तरह की बात हम सोचें ये कोविड के बारे में कि एक सीमा आएगी जब ये मैक्सिमम होगा उसके बाद चीजें सुधर जाएंगी तो गालिब के इस लाइन के साथ अभी भी काफी रेलिवेंट है मैं समाप्त करना चाहूंगा इस तरह कतरा का दरिया में फना हो जाना इस तरह कतरा का दरिया में फना हो जाना दर्द का हद से गुजर जाना है दवा हो जाना थैंक यू वेरी मच